Trisha Gleason, Assistant City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, August 7th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Duke City Council for August 7th, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input and virtual audio or written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there are any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log on to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access codes that appear on the broadcast and live stream and post on the, and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during an appro appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accommodated, accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for tonight's meeting is, a, is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you, Mayor Cavanaugh. I'll turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Trish. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> we'll begin with our proclamations. Tonight we have one proclamation for National Health Center Week, August 6th through the 12th. All right, thank you, Trish, and I believe we have Kayla Schneider here to accept this proclamation. You can come on up if you want, and uh, if you have a few words to say before I read the proclamation, feel free. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kayla Schneider. Uh, Mission Advancement and Community Relations Director at Crescent Community Health Center. And first and foremost, I want to thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh, and City Council members for all of your support to Crescent Community Health Center and for everything that you do for our community. As you will hear, the proclamation of National Health Center Week is this week. And um, every August, the National Association of Community Health Centers celebrates National Health Center Week. It's, uh, this year's theme is a roadmap to a stronger America, and what it does is it allows uh, 1,400 community health centers nationwide to really showcase the impact and the support that, that community health centers do for the communities that they serve. Uh, Crescent Community Health Centers, our service area spans over 10 counties long. We are one of 14 community health centers in Iowa, and just in 2022, we served, or we had over 33,000 clinic visits, and we served over 9,200 patients. 24% uh, of our patients speak another language other than English, and about 80% of our patients are below the federal poverty levels. So that just goes the, the support and the growth that we've, that we've seen and, and the necessary support from all of you. So we're grateful, thank you. And uh, I know you have a hefty agenda, so I won't, I'll keep my remarks brief. 
Well, well thank you so much, yeah. Kayla, for being here. We appreciate it. And, and don't go anywhere because you're, you're going to actually oh, get yes. this when no. I'm done with it. But thank you very much for the work that you do and everyone at Crescent. Uh, it's very important community service. And we know you're, by the numbers you're showing us, you're doing a great job. So thank you for being here to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas for more than 50 years, community health centers have provided high quality, affordable, comprehensive, primary and preventive care in our nation's under underserved communities, delivering value to and having a significant impact on America's healthcare system. And whereas as the country's largest primary care network, community health centers are the health center home for 30 million Americans in over 14,000 communities across the nation. One in every 12 people in the United States gets their care in a community health center. And whereas community health centers are locally owned and operated small businesses that serve as critical economic engines, helping to power local economies by generating $85 billion in economic activity in some of the country's most economically deprived communities. And whereas National Health Center Week offers the opportunity to celebrate American, America's over 1,400 health center organizations with over 12,000 service delivery sites. Their dedicated staff, board members, patients, and all those responsible for their continued success and growth since the first health centers opened their doors more than 50 years ago. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the week of August 6th through the 12th, 2023, as National Health Center Week in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and I encourage all Americans to take part in this week by visiting their local health center and celebrating the important partnership between America's community health centers and the communities they serve. All right, Trish. Next on the agenda are the consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium. When the mayor asks if there is any in-person input, state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like to remove from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. Consent items can be found on pages one through five. Thank you, Trish. Do we have anyone here in chambers who would like to remove any of the consent items for any separate discussion this evening? I see no one here. Do we have anyone virtually? You do not. Okay. Anything from the city clerk's office? No. Nope. All right. And seeing no one, I'll take it back to the table. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to, re uh, move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We'll move on to items <clears throat> to be set for public hearing. We have five agenda items to be set for public hearing. One, a petition to vacate a portion of National Street in the City of Dubuque, Iowa for vacating petition, agreement between City of Dubuque and Dennis R. Walker for August 21st, 2023. Two, setting a public hearing for the Fourth Amendment to Development Agreement between the City of Dubuque and Port of Dubuque, LLC for August 21st, 2023. Number three, extension of fiber optics cable facilities agreement with Mediacom Iowa LLC for August 21st, 2023. Four, 2023 maintenance dredging project initiate public improvement bidding process, project number 554 6000001 304-67990. Harbor Area Dredging for August 1st, 2023. I'm sorry, August 21st, 2023. And 
Uh, item number five, a public hearing for community development block grant fiscal year 24 <coughs> annual action plan amendment number one for September 18th, 2023. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates specified. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We'll move on to boards and commissions. We have appointments to the following commissions to be made at this meeting. Airport Zoning Commission, Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, Civic Center Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, Housing Commission, and the Long Range Planning Advisory Commission. All right, thank you, Trish. So we have a few appointments to make tonight, so it'll take a few minutes, but um, we'll just take these one at a time, and I'm going to go back and forth from uh, asking for motions, or we'll do a roll call for several of them. So for the uh, Airport Zoning Commission, we have two members of the Zoning Advisory Commission that must be appointed. Um, we have some, uh, we are, have a request by the Zoning Advisory Commission to appoint Rich Russell and Matt Mulligan, so I'll take a motion on this, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that Rich Russell and Matt Mulligan be appointed to the Airport Zoning Commission. Second by Sprank. And a motion by Jones and a and second. For the term lengths recommended. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Still second, Mr. Sprank? Yes. All right. So we got a motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Um, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Rich Russell and Matt Mulligan are appointed to the Air Airport Zoning Commission. Next up is the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment. Um, similar situation, two members recommended by the Zoning Board of Adjustment, um, Jonathan McCoy and Rena Stearman. So I would entertain a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that Jonathan McCoy and Rena Stearman be appointed to the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment for the terms recommended. Second. Motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Jonathan McCoy and Rena Stearman are appointed to the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment. Next up, we have the Civic Center Commission. We have one three-year term through June 29th, 2024, and one applicant. Uh, we'll entertain a motion here, too, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we nominate Danielle Jacobs to one three-year term through Ju June 29th of 2024. Second by Wethel. Motion by Spring, second by Wethel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Daniel Jacobs is appointed to the Civic Center Commission. Next up, we have the Historic Preservation Commission. Here we have one interim term um, due to vacancies of the Cathedral District term and the Old Main District term. And then we have two applicants. So in this case, I would ask that Trish, you please call the roll and we will go through and uh, see who has more votes. Roussel. Heidi Pettit. Barber. Heidi Pettit. Resnick. Heidi Pettit. Wethel. Heidi Pettit. Jones. Heidi Pettit. Sprank. Heidi Pettit. Kavanaugh. Heidi Pettit. So Heidi Pettit is appointed to the Historic Preservation Commission. Next up, we have the Housing Commission. Here we have two three-year terms through August 17th, 2026. Um, we have four different applicants. So um, somebody remind me, please. Do we usually do one at a time, or do we just, can we do the most votes get both? Because they are both at large terms in this case, kind of. I'm thinking. Whatever's easiest. I always forget. I think we start by having everybody do one name and see if anybody gets a majority vote. Okay. And then if they do, one is selected, and then we do a roll call again. Thank you, Krenna. Everybody clear? Okay. Trish, could you call the roll, please? Roussel. Amy U. Daly. Barber. Julietta Scott. Resnick. Julietta Scott. Wethel. Julietta Scott. Jones. Julietta Scott. Sprank. Julietta Scott. Kavanaugh. Julietta Scott. 
So Julieta Scott is appointed to one of the three-year terms through August 17th, 2026. So we'll do that one more time, please, Trish, and we'll see who is the next appointee. Roussel. Amy, you daily. <clears throat> Barber. Matthew Hynek. Resnick. Amy, you daily. Wethel. Amy, you daily. Jones. Amy, you daily. Sprank. Uh, Amy, you daily. Kavanaugh. Amy, you daily. So Amy, you daily is appointed to the other two year, I'm sorry, or the three year term for the Housing Commission. Next up, we have the Long Range Planning Advisory Commission. We have one three year term through July 1st, 2026, and one applicant, uh, Michael Rabagia. I will entertain a motion on here, please. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move we appoint Michael Rabagia to the Long Range Planning Advisory Commission. Second. We got a motion by Roussel, second by Jones. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Michael Rabagia is appointed to the Long Range Planning Advisory Commission. And before we move on, I just want to say thank you to all the applicants and new appointees. Uh, we really appreciate having so many people volunteering their time for these commissions. It's actually very important here in the city. So thank you. Thank you, Trish. We move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is um, Equity and Human Rights Commission request for commissioners commissioner removal. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. The motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Uh, Mike, I'm coming to you for a statement on this one. Okay. Yes, okay. You, can, you can come to me. So pursuant to the city code, there is a process uh, under the Human Rights Commission ordinance. It's section 8-2-12, which addresses removal of someone who sits on the Equity and Human Rights Commission. And it reads, the City Council may remove any commissioner for cause upon written charges after a public hearing. So what you have as part of your uh, agenda items um, is a letter um, penned by the chair of the Equity and Human Rights Commission related to uh, requesting removal of a commissioner, um, Derricka Williams Robinson, and asking that an appointment be, uh, a replacement be appointed after removal. Um, the information provided from the commission is that the appointment occurred originally on February 1st, 2022, and three meetings were attended in 2022, February 14th, 2022, March 14th, 2022, and May 8th, 2022. Many attempts um, have been made to reach the commissioner um, by email, by both uh, Carla Anderson, the current chair, and her predecessor um, without success. At a meeting of the Equity and Human Rights Commission on July 10th, the commission voted unanimously to forward this recommendation to the council, asking that it be set for public hearing, and then tonight is the uh, the resultant opportunity for that. Um, and it closes by saying that the request doesn't come easily, but honoring the attendance policy that is needed for boards and commissions, um, they have no choice but to ask for such. And along with that, there is, um, with the agenda materials, um, proof of notice of the hearing, and I believe there was some supplemental information provided related to attendance for uh, the, the commission. Okay. 
Thank you, Krenna. We are in a public hearing to consider a request from the Equity and Human Rights Commission to remove Commissioner Derricka Williams Robinson from the Equity and Human Rights Commission for non-compliance with the attendance requirement of the Code of, Code of Ordinances. So do we have anyone from the public to address us on this item? Anyone virtually? No. Okay. Anyone from the city clerk's office, Trish? No. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones, go ahead. Let me just say that we've got a lot of people serving a lot of commissions and they really honor the city and their fellow citizens by doing so. And it's, it's a big task, um, but it's one you gotta show up for. And that's what this is all about. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Jones. And this is not this is not something that we as a council take lightly. We do not like to remove people for non-attendance from from commissions, but um, it does happen, and it is within the code, and it is something that, as Mr. Jones pointed out, um, we need people to to be there. So unfortunately, this is what we we come to sometimes, and it does happen. So, any other comments? Okay, then the motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Russell, aye. Barber, aye. Resnick, aye. Weppel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number two is petition to vacate a portion of Bees Drive in the city of Dubuque, Iowa for vacating peti petition agreement between city of Dubuque and CCI 5 LLC. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Farber. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolutions. Second. <clears throat> Got a motion by Farber, second by Wethel. The mic, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. <clears throat> city Engineer Gus Ahoyas is recommending City Council adopt a resolution approving the vacating and disposal of city interest of the Bees Drive right-of-way property described as Lot 1B of Roger F. and Kathleen A. Clower Family Place in the City of Dubuque. Mr. Joel Callahan is the owner and developer of an approximately two acre property at the northeast quadrant of the intersection at Bees Drive, Sylvan Drive, and Century Drive. Mr. Callahan plans to develop the property for multifamily residential use. The approved site plan includes two 28 plex buildings with associated parking and garages. In the future, the city intends to reconstruct the intersection of Bees Drive, Sylvan Drive, and Century Drive. This reconstruction will include roadway improvements, sidewalk installation, and utility improvements. The city has conceptually designed the reconstructed intersection and determined that the future project will include the relocation of the alignment of Century Drive, which will require the acquisition of certain right-of-way from the Callahan property. Mr. Callahan is willing to dedicate the necessary additional right-of-way to the city in exchange for an unneeded portion of an existing city called the sac right-of-way area on the east side of the intersection. The parties have agreed the land transfers are substantially equivalent in value. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider accepting a resolution approving the vacating and disposal of city interest in the, of the Bees Drive right-of-way. Uh, Property described as Lot 1B of Roger F. and Kathleen A. Clower Family Place in the city of Dubuque, Iowa. Do we have any public comment on this item? Seeing none here, do we have anyone virtually? None. Thank you. Nope. No. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. All right, seeing none. Motion here is to receive and file and adopt the resolutions. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Weffel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number three is for Burlington Street Water Main Improvement Project 2023. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Sprank? Motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolutions. Second. We got a motion by Sprank, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Water Department Manager Christopher Lester is recommending City Council approve the plan, specifications, form of contract, an estimated cost of $440,300 for the Burlington Street Water Main Improvement Project 2023. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider the plan specifications, form of contract, and estimated <coughs> cost of $440,300 for the Burlington Street Water Main Improvement Project. Do we have anyone from the public to address us on this item? Trish? 
Travis Freeze, WHKS and Company. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the ones that did the plans and the work for this project, so just want to let you guys know I'm here if you guys have any questions about it. Um, in general, it's an 820 plus feet uh, water main replacement project with two new uh, vacuum valves in the location that the city identified as a weak weakness in their system, so. Okay, That's it. Travis, thank you very much yeah. for your comments. Any others? Okay, anyone virtually? Nope. All right. No. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Sprank. Just wanna thank, thank city staff for getting this on the books finally, because there's been a number of citizens that have been Okay, when, what, what winter will we have problems up there? So I'm sure we'll have some happy neighbors, so thank you. Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, I guess I have a question for Mr. Zahoyas, and that is, it sounds like there could be quite a bit of disruption with this project. Maybe not, but I'd love to hear uh, him talk about it. And has a timetable been developed, and uh, have the citizens been uh, notified and consulted? Those are my questions. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, Christopher Lester, Water Department Manager. I can answer some of those questions for you. Um, so tentative start date for the construction commencing is September 1st of 2023. Estimated project completion date is November 15th. Um, at this time, we have not notified citizens yet, but that is in the plan to notify the residents that will be impacted in this area along the Burlington Street. Um, again, we're right now just uh, holding the public hearing on plans and specifications. We have not went out for bid yet on the project. That will, um, we're opening the bids on August 10th, so later this week. Um, but part of, the, part of the plan is to notify the residents that will be impacted um, with the length of the schedule, how they will be impacted, you know, any water shutdowns according to the schedule, um, that, will, that will all be done in accordance to um, standard. Okay, th thank you. And is this uh, gonna be a whole block uh, or two blocks or are you gonna tear up the street, you're gonna have detours and all that type of thing? Um, yes, so it's, uh, I think Travis, about 100, 820 feet will be well, we, we installed some new main uh, several years ago that we'll be tying on to, so we won't be replacing the whole length of Burlington Street, uh, but we'll, it will be a significant portion of that road. Um, again, the contract will work with the homeowners in the area as far as giving them a tentative date when we'll be impacting their homes, uh, the, t the amount of time the water will be shut off so we can do new tie-ins to the new main, obviously. So again, that will be um, coordination between the contractor, the engineering firm who's doing the inspection, which is WHKS, and the homeowner. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bet. Mayor. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you all. Yeah, bottom line is we know that there's gonna be some delays. We know that there's gonna be some challenges when you do something this big, but it sure is better than your water mains breaking over and over again, isn't it? I mean, yes. that's really kind of the, the bottom line that we have here, as Mr. Sprank pointed out too. So so thank you all. Okay, thank the you. Uh, motion here is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Uh, motion by Sprank, second by Jones. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Weppel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next on the agenda is public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks, are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that to be or that do not relate to an action item on the agenda. Thank you, Trish. Do we have any public input this evening from anyone here in chambers? I'm seeing none. Any virtual input this evening? Virtual input. Okay. 
Anything? No. Nope. City Clerk's Office? Okay. So having no public input then, we can move on to action items, please, Trish. Okay. Action item number one, small business grant program proposed modifications approved by the Community Development Advisory Commission. <coughs> Motion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the, the documents and, uh, and approve. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director, Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council approval of the changes to our existing small business grant program in response to evolving small business needs and entrepreneurial ecosystem development that have been presented to and approved by the Community <laughs> Development Advisory Commission. Over time, both city and Fountain of Youth staff have continued to evaluate and improve the program design and through collaboration have identified new funds to enhance the program. City staff are currently participating in a National League of Cities, Cities of Opportunities program to accelerate our entrepreneurial ecosystem through the creation of a hub and spoke model. The National League of Cities program provides $15,000 to implement an ecosystem accelerator activity. This pairs with a $400,000 grant received by the Innovation Lab from the Dubuque County ARPA funds, which are also dedicated to the creation of a hub and spoke model. The Innovation Lab is acting as the hub and is utilizing the $15,000 to put together the infrastructure needs to bring ongoing capital to seed stage and launch stage businesses. Both City and Greater Dubuque Development Corporation staff are also participating in the Economic Mobility and Opportunity Program through the International City County Management Association, focused on boosting upward mobility in local communities. The program is providing $30,000 to address workforce preparation and training issues, as well as being used for small grants to area entrepreneurs, including minority, women, disabled, and LGBTQ owned businesses. $9,000 of the stipend will be directed to marketing the Opportunity to Dubuque program, which is the NICC job training program, with a goal of doubling program completions. $21,000 will be programmed to provide additional small business grants. The planned approach is to run the small business grant program with a cohort comprised of both low to moderate income participants and non low to moderate income participants using funds from the two different sources, the Community Development Block Grant and the International City County Management Association, assigned to the participants based on how they qualify for the program. Our goal is to assist businesses with a true need for capital, not those with well established access to capital. To that end, we propose an eligibility criterion for the ICMA funds to be a business which nets the owner less than a living wage for the owner's household as defined by the United Way's Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed or ALICE calculations, regardless of total household income. In this way, the program supports businesses which would not provide their owner with a living wage. We believe the goal of our program should be to create businesses that allow the owner to have their businesses to be their sole source of income. This funding source appropriation happens behind the scenes. The program will be identical for the participants, including the technical assistance requirements and the eligible expenses under the grant. Covered expenses are only those allowed under Community Development Block Grant regulations. One modification also being proposed is to increase the grant amount to $5,000 instead of the current $3,000. The city has remaining funds from this fiscal year and $50,000 of community, develop, <coughs> community Development Block Grant funding is budgeted for fiscal year 2024. <coughs> With a total available funds, taking into consideration the increase to a $5,000 grant, We will be able to serve up to 13 businesses <clears throat> owned by low and moderate income individuals 
and up to four non-low and moderate income individuals during the fiscal year. <clears throat> we will also be updating our data gathering before, during, and after the program to measure the impact of the program. The proposal was presented to the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Commission at its July 19th meeting. Staff answered several questions from the commissioners <clears throat> due to a lack of a quorum and an email vote was taken following the days which the commission approved the proposed changes. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. To carry yourself over there. It's a long night. <laughs> Don't forget to tag Corey in if you need her, you know, that's why she's there, right there. Okay, so um, discussion, questions. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Resnick. I just want to be clear about the source of funds that we have. How much uh, City of Dubuque general uh, <laughs> you know, funds from the, the general fund are involved with this? I see we have some grants and other things. Uh, if you wouldn't mind telling me how much actual taxpayer, um, City of Dubuque citizens, taxpayer money is in this program. Thank you. Jill Connors, Economic Development Director. The answer is zero. All the money comes from the federal government or from the Iowa Community or City Managers Association. Okay, and is there going to be um, some kind of committee that goes through all this uh, and they listen to the different, you know, they look at the applications and uh, they recommend a funding level or obviously there'll be a funding request with the a grant application. Uh, is there some kind of... Uh, group that's going to recommend uh, yay or nay, and is the proper funding level uh, asked for? There's not a committee to decide. The applications are being taken sequentially until uh, we run out of funds. And then each individual will be eligible for up to $5,000. And they have to show proof of the eligible expenses. So we don't cut them off at a certain level until they get to $5,000. I see, and, and so you are the committee? Yes. Okay, great. Having worked with other, with Fountain of Youth staff and with um, Greater Dubuque Development staff and other city staff to come up with the parameters. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just to follow that real quick, you're building on a program that, you, yeah. that already exists, that you've already right. had in place. Right. Yeah, and it's just adding some, some new funds to this and working with uh, new partners to be able to get that exactly. done. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jill, when this first started, it was like $1,000 we were giving out, and that really isn't enough to no. help somebody, some small business that's struggling. So I'm, I'm glad to see that an idea from two years ago that we've been able to come up with a way to give a little more to help these businesses so they can thrive. So thank you. Others? Well, you know, I, uh, I was sitting with you at the National League of Cities Conference when we talked about the, we first did a, um, learned a little bit more about this ecosystem accelerator project. And I was excited to see how you were gonna take it and, and where you were gonna, where you're gonna run with it. And the fact that you put this partnership together and added to something that was already working pretty well, I think is a great idea. So Thanks. congratulations on that and thank you for your work with it. Um, very excited to see where it goes. Me too. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, then the motion is to receive and file and approve. Trish, would you call the roll please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Cabinet? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is City of Dubuque Secondary Responders Update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file and hear the presentation. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Going, we'll go straight to Chief for this one. He's tagging the Chief in. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Chief of Police Jeremy Jensen. So I promised you I'd come back quarterly and, and report to you on the secondary responder model. As you all know, back in September 2022, you made this a priority for us to look into to do something here with this. Uh, obviously, in, in previous updates, we have not idly sat by with this. Uh, we've, we created the foundation or the backbone, as I like to call it, through our internal working group. What I want to emphasize with that part of it is that they have been working on, again, meeting bi-weekly. They are now working on um, multiple projects within the city, cross-departmental. Uh, the nice thing there, we took essentially our department managers out of it and let the workers do the work. And, and they really are doing the work with that. 
uh, a couple additions to that. I put in there about the, the org chart, but really the org chart was still updating, so <laughs> you don't have a new org chart. Uh, one of the, the big positions, or one of the key areas we've been filling with that is the community impact division under Heather Satterley. Um, she has hired the uh, community partnerships person here a couple months ago. They've been part of the internal working group. And she just finished up interviews for the diversion, which is the jail diversion, fines and fees and that. Um, so hopefully that person will be added real soon here. Another key component to this, um, delving into the, into the judicial side of things. Um, as for the police department, um, our, our CIT, our critical incident team, we talked about this a lot. And then if you saw recently, there was an article on this um, about where we're going with that. Um, great news with that. Um, as you know, we got a $250,000 hiring grant last year from the Department of Justice. Um, we are able to now fully fill the positions. Additionally, we got a grant from the um, mental health region, the East Central Mental Health Region, to have a law enforcement liaison civilian. I don't, actually she was gonna be here. She and Corporal Joel Cross, who are, is a CIT member, are on a CIT call right now. They texted me literally about five minutes ago and said, I don't know if we're gonna get away. So I was gonna introduce you to them. We'll do that at another time. But I will like to introduce to some of our other, our team members. In the memo I said an officer to be named later. That officer has been named. Officer Brendan Nugent right here, uh, picked late last week. They will all be starting the third week in September as the full full team, full CIT team, I'm working on it. As you saw in the numbers I put in the memo, there's a couple things with that. We're at 390 some calls for service or mental health calls already this year, uh, higher than we've ever been. Uh, and since I wrote that, that number has gone up. You know, that, that is a daily number. So the need is still there and it is still climbing with that. Uh, as I said, Caitlin has been added, as Caitlin Doyle is part of our team through Foundation Two. She has been with our team already, and obviously they're out working. Um, the goal with that is, again, to have a civilian side of that where people react, and also to, to connect with providers uh, within that realm. Uh, I have Captain Steve Radloff here. The CIT division is going to fall under the community policing, as you authorized back in May, some funds to remodel, essentially, right out here. Several offices right out the, this door here. Uh, we've got some news today that the RFPs will be going out here shortly. Hopefully we'll be executing that contract in, in early September. So we'll be starting, hopefully here by fall here, starting our, getting that done and getting moved in here with all those divisions under one roof, which is pretty exciting for us to have that. Uh, the other part that I, I'd like to point out here with, with all this, and, and we talk a lot about brain health, but I don't want people just to think it's brain health. There's substance abuse and there's, there's unhoused and all this goes together. Uh, they're not siloed, they're interconnected. And I really, I really want to emphasize that. Uh, recently, we began working with the uh, Dubuque Rescue Mission as part of that. Assistant City Manager Burbach has been heading that up. As part of, uh, of our response to that, we signed a CIT officer as a liaison down there. Uh, and we've, we're seeing some really good results. And it's a partnership with trying to help them uh, at their request. Uh, they said, you know, we're seeing brain health issues and we need, need some help there. And, you know, we're trying to really address the issues there. As you can see in the memo, I think we had 36 homeless camps that we addressed last year. I want to point out, we issued no citations, if you can see that, none on that. And I know that was a concern that we were going to start to find people. But if you look, we had like 14 people that we gave services to. I will emphasize, some people do not want our services. They, they will not, they will not take them, do not want them. Uh, but we do offer them in every case. You know, in the model that we presented before, we give them several days to move on. We try to find them the services and trying to connect them if, if they need it. And that's the, the model that we're, we're um, building with the secondary responder here is to have that, to be able to connect the dots and find the best, best customized service for somebody that we can. Great. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation the update. Questions? Discussion? Mr. Mr. Resnick, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I guess I have some citizens asking about some uh, secondary responder engagement criteria. Specifically, they noticed that uh, we have intersection panhandlers that they think could, may, they, they need assistance. Uh, and do we, um, because you don't, uh, ask for money in, in intersections in a dangerous place unless there's some, some issues perhaps that maybe we could help them with uh, some kind of programs. Do we, uh, and this ties into my second question, which is 
Uh, secondary responder, does it assume then or does it imply that the police are primary and then the brain health professional is secondary, meaning the police show up first? And then if there's an issue, you call for this uh, secondary responder? How does that work? Now, let me start with your first question. So, A, panhandling, not a crime. So we'll start with that. The second part, if we get called to and they're in a dangerous intersection, we do offer services. Again, if somebody wants services and we can do that, Again, we, people turn us down. Um, we've had, uh, you know, sometimes people that don't want to interact with us in those situations, but on the, the other side, if they do, we'll, we'll offer them services for sure. You know, and then that's part of what this says. The second part of that is, uh, quite frankly, in Dubuque, 911 generally is the first call for mental health. Um, and that's where we get involved in it. But police aren't the only first responder. Um, you have fire department in the, in the EMS side of that. Um, and sometimes the call goes in through who know, whoever knows, provider, that kind of thing. But we do get that first call. So when we get that first call, we do respond. That's with the CIT. So our secondary responder, as you look at some other models where you have other people coming out and responding, we're there. So we're, we're handling, we're helping them connect the dots, essentially in real time, as opposed to we'll connect you with a service and hopefully you get connected down the road here in a little bit. We are really looking for that. An example of what we give, um, if we have somebody in crisis, and we know where their provider is because of our liaison model and because of what we do with our providers. We will actually call the provider because we meet with them regularly on a first name basis and say, hey, we have so-and-so here, they're in crisis, can we get them to an appointment? And most of the time we get, if you can get them here now and we'll drive them there. That's the real time version of that. So that gives us the um, ability not to push somebody down the road and let the crisis continue. Great, great, great answers. Thank you. And I was going to ask you if you have one on call, and uh, you went right to that. So yeah. that's that's great. Yeah. So the way we work is actually with the police department, CIT. So we will have three full time people, but we also have part time officers. So every new officer is actually trained in it as part of the academy curriculum now. But we have eight other officers that are part of the part time, and they really um, are passionate about this, and they pretty much cover. I should say roughly twenty four seven. We have coverage with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Wethel. I'd just like to thank uh, everyone involved. I know it's been multiple departments in the um, behind the scenes work that's been done. I know that I've asked a lot of questions and there's always great answers about the progress being made. And so <clears throat> I really appreciate all of, all of those involved and I know it's many. Um, I think we need to give a lot of credit to our officers and their ability to be so adaptive to the needs of our community right now. Um, they've been doing this on their own, trying to be all things to all people. And there's only so many of you, and we need to create resources for you and for our citizens. And so this is an incredible step. I think it could be a program that we could create a model for that will be actually mimicked and, and modeled for other communities because um, to me it's been such a successful execution so far. So thank you in advance for your commitment to the program and to your community and um, thanks to all your officers for really being all of these people um, all the time for so long. And now I'll be remiss, I almost missed a big part of this when you brought up providers. So working with the Community Foundation and Chris Corkin, we've been essentially surveying providers to see what their, their mission, their capability, um, and what they want to do in this world. Again, trying to connect the dots. Um, and, and what I heard today is we have 15 providers that have provided that background information. Again, we're trying to help them communicate, again, within the, the, the legal realms of HIPAA and that kind of thing to help find the best services. Again, back to that substance abuse is not alone from brain health, which is not alone from from homelessness. These are the things we want to make sure that we're getting complete. Thank you. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. And uh, I continue to be pleased with the <clears throat> compassionate response that we use for, for handling this situation. It's, it's a, a, a challenging, um, it's a challenging place to be because um, sometimes when you don't see what's happening, you think nothing's happening. And um, I happen to, to um, serve on a board where there's a lot of uh, downtown business owners. And um, 
if, if I'm a business owner and, and I have a concern about something that's going on in the downtown area, what's my best, what's my best um, solution? Or if I see something of concern, shall I, should I just call the non-dispatch number? Or what's my best approach? Yeah, there's a couple options. You can do it non-emergency dispatch if there's concerns. And again, you know, we're, we're trying to be compassionate. We're trying to make sure we don't violate people's civil rights with that. Uh, but yeah, I call that web QA. That's another version that they, they can do um, to submit their concerns. Again, what we want to hear about them and, and, and we want to have conversations because this is, um, I know there's some concern that we're not doing anything with, with mm -hmm. that. And, and obviously we are because we, like I pointed out in the statistical data, um, we don't want, um, we we're trying to accommodate everybody in, in this situation and, and, and we're trying to do it with dignity and respect but also respect the business owners and respect you know, um, what, th what they're bringing to this. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate your being here tonight so that everyone can hear the good work that you have going on. If I could add to that, uh, Assistant City Manager Corey Burbach, one of the things that we're working on with the Dubuque Rescue Mission to do this fall is to host a, um, a chance for community to come together in the downtown. Because we want particularly what we've heard from our downtown employers is those employees that might come in very early or go to their cars very late, we want them to feel safe as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that uh, some of our employees might just not quite know how to approach some of our neighbors that are living on the streets or in front of or behind their buildings. Um, so we are working with the Rescue Mission and Community Solutions of Eastern Iowa to host an opportunity for us to build community with some of those residents this fall. So you can send them our way, um, either the chief or myself, and we'll connect them with that as well. Wonderful, thank you. I want to make sure I add something too, um, just because I, I I caught it, and I want to make sure that I, we we say it for everybody to know. You you mentioned that another way that people can can say or report a concern is through what we call Web QA on our end of it, which is what the staff answer to. But if you go to the website, it's just report a concern right at the bottom of the website, um, and that's the easiest way to just click a button and be able to report that if you want to do that online too. Any other questions? Discussion. So um, this is. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm so happy to see this come together. You're doing a great job to put this together. And you keep pointing out something that's incredibly important that I hope we can really help to educate the community about, and that is the connections between all these things that we're talking about. This isn't just about mental health or brain health. It's not about homelessness. It's not just about substance abuse. It's all these things together. And that's <laughs> the point, is to be able to have a holistic approach to this. Um, and I, I would agree with Ms. Wethel's comments about the work that you and your, your department is doing to be able to answer these calls um, in, the, in the years leading up to this. It, it's incredibly challenging. And to have some other professionals to come in to help to respond to this, I think, is really, really important. And one of the things I want to point out, too, is there's really good evidence on programs like this that show that it's, you know, you mentioned that there are some people that just don't want the services they don't want um, to be able to, to get the help that some other people might think that they need. Programs and approaches like this actually do increase service connection and utilization across the country. So it's really good that you're getting this opportunity to, to put this together and that you're doing all this work. So thank you. <laughs> You know, we have, we have officers learning first name basis of people, right? And so, you know, maybe they turn us down the first time and maybe the next time they turn us down. Maybe the third time they say, you know what, let, let's try the service. I trust you. Because there is a trust factor with certain populations. They do not trust that, that uh, government or anybody's going to really has their best interest in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And it takes those relationships, doesn't it, to build yep. that? Um, my last question is, so there's a lot of action, a lot of moving parts here. What's the next update? What are you planning to, how often are we going to be hearing about this publicly? So what's quarterly? From so quarterly. <laughs> yeah. That's roughly, a good enough answer. That's all, that's all we By need. the end of the year, I'm hopefully yep. to report after the next report that we'll, we're moved in and we got some reports and we'll have some more data for you. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you very much, Chief. Appreciate it. All right. Well, with that, we have a motion to receive and file. Um, and that is the motion by Mr. Jones, second by Sprank. So Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number three is safety and security camera and automated license plate reader policy. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor? Ms. Farber? I mo make a motion to receive and file and approve the policy. Second. Motion by Farber, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. 
Chief of Police Jeremy Jensen is recommending City Council approve the updated policy on City of Dubuque traffic camera use with the addition of automated license plate readers. Uh, I want to point out that this isn't the first time that the Mayor and City Council has heard about this. So as part of the fiscal year 2024 budget process in March of 2023, so earlier this year, uh, we recommended that the City Council budget some dollars, that if they so cho chose later to support this idea, that there was already money available to do it. And so there was a robust discussion as part of the budget process. And remember, that's all a public process, televised and available to residents. <coughs> Then May 1st, 2025, uh, the police department and the engineering department held a work session with the city council here in the council chambers and talked about uh, how this would work and the advantages of it. Uh, once again, that was a public meeting televised and available for public to, to uh, observe. And then on May 15th, 2023, uh, the vendor, Flock Safety, came and conducted a work session with the city council to explain technically how the system works and also to answer all the council questions about the technical side of the system. And once again, that work session was a public work session. It was televised and for the public and the media to observe. And throughout that process, the council had asked some questions that I believe were answered by the police department, the engineering department, and the private vendor. And uh, the only way to implement it now is for the council to approve a change in our existing policy, which does not include this. And so that's what the chief Jeremy Jensen is recommending tonight, that the policy be changed so that we can implement the system. And of course, Jeremy is available to answer any questions. I concur with his recommendation and I respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. All right, discussion. Mayor Jones. We just heard that uh, about a new program that our police departments initiated to show the city and its citizens the compassion and the desire not to arrest people that don't need arresting and I think that speaks highly of their leadership, of Mike's leadership, of JJ's leadership, of the team that's on the streets, and what they're, what they're trying to do to make the community a better place. Some people need arresting, and they need arresting pretty quickly. If your child's ever abducted, um, boy, it'd be nice to have a camera system that could find the license plate in the offending car and affect that arrest with greater certainty and, and swiftness um, and get your child back. If your car is ever stolen, it'd be nice to get your car back. Um, right now, officers have computers in their cars and they know what vehicles are being looked for. How long is the list usually on a, on a given shift? How many vehicles do you, are on a wanted list? JJ. I don't know exactly, but the, the thing is it's nationwide too. So you don't know what's coming and going on stolen vehicles in and out of the city, you know. Exactly, another point, thank you. Um, that is another good point. A vehicle stolen in any other state that's entered into the National Crime Information System that suddenly pops up coming into the city of Dubuque and one of our cameras is gonna to come to our attention and help somebody in maybe Seattle get their vehicle back um, and get somebody who's coming to Dubuque with uh, perhaps not good intentions to be interrupted. There's, there's nothing but good in this thing. Now I've heard from some people that are really against this. They're against it because they don't like facial recognition. Well, it doesn't do that. They're against it because they don't want to be tracked. It doesn't do that either. It tracks the cars we tell it to track. It tracks the cars that the police department enters into the system that need to be tracked, that every officer is looking for, but you can't see everything all the time. When you're driving a car and you've got radios and computer screens and everything at you, you might just miss that red Chevy going the other direction or following behind you or three blocks ahead of you that you don't even know is there. Um, unless they go through one of these cameras and you suddenly get an alert that that vehicle's right in front of me. They can get some other cars here and affect a felony stop and safely interrupt the activity of that driver. We can't afford not to do this. This is cutting edge technology, but it's not new. It's, it's gonna become a standard of care in policing. And you've already seen that this police department doesn't wanna make criminals out of people. This police department 
is honorable and honors its policy. I had some people concerned about mission creep. Well, that's just what you want today, but what are you gonna to do tomorrow? What are they gonna do once you allow this? Well, for one thing, this policy that's been created by staff is in front of the city council, the elected governing body, to enact it and approve it. Um, that means that we're gonna hear from the public again next time someone suggests a change in it. Maybe there, there'll, there'll certainly be changes as other technologies come to fruition, as other ideas come into fruition, as other uses of the technology. But this isn't about Joe Blow going to get groceries and, and missing the stop sign. This isn't about somebody driving five miles over the speed limit or 10 or even 12. Um, this isn't speed enforcement, this isn't anything. This is known wanted criminals known wanted vehicles for criminal investigations, that uh, the sooner th those investigations and conversations are happening, the sooner the cuffs go on, somebody that needs the cuffs put on them, the better off we all are. We're proud of being a safe community. This is one of the reasons. Um, had some people tell me, well, we got so many cameras, I feel like I'm being watched all the time. You know what, we've had a lot of cameras for a long time because a citizen group told us we needed them and we started putting them in. I can't think of one person whose life was changed negatively because of all these cameras, except people who do crimes. Their lives change, and they change quickly. And sometimes they would have gone unnoticed. We had a homicide in Dubuque just a, just a year ago. Had it not been for, for cameras, because it was an unknown, the parties weren't known to each other, because there was no connection except a video trail, likelihood of ever making an arrest in that was pretty slim but it was in Dubuque, and there were cameras, and officers spent a lot of hours retracing steps and watching addresses to put that case together, and they fairly quickly, well, they discovered this guy had, was kind of bad at a lot of things. He's already in the jail, um, but he could have been processed out by the time they, they connected the dots on it, but he wasn't. They were able to fairly quickly make an arrest and uh, get a conviction in this, in this first degree homicide case. So I'd, I'd urge my colleagues to set aside all the things that this isn't about and focus on the one thing that it is about. It's on the rapid apprehension of criminals, return of stolen property, the rescue of kidnapped victims, um, the solving of crime. This isn't about speeders. It's not about um, parking violations. It's not about petty crime. It's not about inconveniencing our citizens. It's about saving their lives. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, Ms. Farber. if I could give a, a little discussion about the technology that um, Mr. Jones just alluded to. And um, I happen to be on the National League of Cities um, IT committee, and one of the work groups I'm currently on happens to be artic artificial intelligence. And so I have been working uh, diligently over the last couple of weeks, actually working on some guidelines and policies for the National League of Cities to share with municipalities. And just a couple of thoughts um, as I was reviewing the documentation today about what the goal is here for the AI system that is being used in the background for uh, this system. Um, and I would interpret this to be a passive AI system uh, where its goal is truly um, innovation and greater intelligence um, versus what we do today in the current law enforcement set, okay, for what your current operations are. And I believe that it is very responsible and very trustworthy. Um, and it is in a, when you take a look at the impact of it, it's very contextual and it uses symbolic recognition, if you will, instead of a voice language. Okay, so it's kind of as um, I think Rick indicated, it's a picture of a license plate. It is not anything of a person's image or any other details behind that person's image per se. Um, so I believe that this is a very simple algorithm that's related to a thing versus a person. Um, and therefore, that's really a passive, um, trustworthy, if you will, AI base. And um, we have to realize that AI is just exploding and there's a really enormous development on AI, but it happens to deal with more issues about language, multimedia, and some of the things that you might be hearing and seeing um, that are more interactive and have multiple uh, detailed um, technology on the digital side and on the algorithm side. This is very simple and it's very well tested and you actually have the government behind you in terms of proving its trustworthiness. Um, I do think that we, as we look at this policy, would wanna consider some enforceable standards going forward and I know that our T IT committee is working on some of our IA um, standards to ensure safety. 
and maybe even licensings to be a catalyst for innovation for safety here in the city of Dubuque. And I know that that is an ongoing effort uh, that is being uh, looked at now. And Mike indicated today it might take six months or so to get that evolved. And so I was wondering, as you are creating the policy and as we are creating the terms and conditions of the contract, if it would be possible to put in that once our IT framework is established within the city of Dubuque, that we could somehow get that into the terms and conditions of the contract to ensure that there is compliance by the vendor. And then also to have, um, on a regular basis, some kind of audit and checkpoint via the AI framework that we would determine would be the guidelines for the city of Dubuque. Um, again, it's just something very simple. Um, I think it is an ongoing evolution, and so it's going to be changing every time you turn around in terms of the technology that is offered. And um, again, this is, I think, one of the more simple systems for AI. It's very, very trustworthy uh, from what I could understand in the research that we have been looking at for the guidelines that we are establishing for municipalities, by the way. So I, I very much support this, but I would like to get some feedback, if I could, about some flexibility with the terms and conditions, and I don't know if that's Krenna or Jeremy with your negotiations with the vendor and on the policy. I'll answer one part. So for an officer to use it right now, because it's the NCIC Iowa system, right. we have to be certified and tested on that to be able to use it. So we already have a certification to, to be able to even use it. So that's where I'll start with that part. Right. And then the, and then the contract side, I'll let. But that's the certification for the use of the system. Yeah. I'm talking about the AI, potentially our framework that we might provide for guidance for the municipality going forward and anybody that interacts with our database and our systems and things that we use uh, because public safety and cybersecurity is really number one important to every citizen here in Dubuque. And we just want to ensure that it's totally, totally safe uh, all the way around. And it would be nice to have a commitment uh, from the vendor for that transparency. So well, what I would start with is that I'm not a subject matter expert <coughs> on this, so I would rely on our subject matter right. experts and best practices in mm -hmm. the field as we look at putting something like that together or implementing it for the first time in a technology contract, but it's something that should most definitely be on our radar screen for consideration. Thank you, because it's just exploding as we speak. But again, I just want to make sure that everybody appreciates the fact that this is really a very um, honorable, focused system, if you will, from an AI, from a technology point of view. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mr. Resnick. Yeah, thank you. So I'm timing myself so I don't go too long without, because uh, it's, it's a lot, of course, there's a lot here. But let me ask you a question first, Chief. Uh, so the automated license plate reader, do they alert the police, alert the police that the registered owner of that car is wanted for a crime if the vehicle is stolen or if the car is connected to an amber or silver alert? Yeah, it looks, I, as, long, as long as anything, um, any of those things are tied to a vehicle, right. it'll alert to that. Now, do you also check for parking tickets or traffic tickets or any other kind of fines that they owe to the municipality? That's not entered in CIC. That's not entered into that system. Okay, and if unless a warrant was issued for their arrest, but that I don't know if anybody's doing that at this point. That's in time. a tough parking ticket yeah. there. So, I, if you could clarify what Mr. Jones was talking about, it's my understanding that we're not looking for one percent of the uh, people, but we track. We track. I thought that from what I read, every license plate that that reader reads is kept in storage for 30 days, is that correct? Yes. So if we wanted to go back two weeks, we could absolutely see where that license plate has been. That's correct. Uh, okay, sounds like that's everybody. All right. Um, so uh, those, are my, those are my main questions. Um, I do note that Flock Safety does say that they have a, uh, generally they have uh, 30 days for data uh, retention. But uh, where municipalities have a different time span required by law, they are able to comply with all regulations. So I'm hoping uh, when I speak some more about what I've learned that the, the city council members who still have an open mind can think about reducing that time 
that is spent, uh, that we are storing it. Because there's a lot of people who have looked at this. Uh, l let me first just preface things by, by talking about privacy concerns. And I think everybody up here do doesn't necessarily have the privacy concerns that a lot of people who have contacted us have. We're all public people. I could talk to anybody who, who came in. We're on television. I do, you know, conduct things and concerts and things. I'm not, I'm not worried so much about privacy. Our life as a teacher is an open book anyway. So, but privacy concerns are very important. And I just want to read this. This is from uh, uh, Michael McFarland from the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics in Santa Clara. And it's, it's short, but it, I think it gives us some impact about how privacy concerns is not something for somebody else and oh, who, who, you know, this, you know, that's 21st century, that's over. No. So this person says it's important for a number of reasons. Some have to do the consequences of not having privacy. People can be harmed or debilitated. Other reasons are more fundamental, touching the essence of the human personhood. Reverence for the human person as an end in itself and an autonomous being requires respect for personal privacy. To lose control of one's personal information is in some measure to lose control of one's life and one's dignity. Therefore, even if privacy is not in itself a fundamental right, it is necessary to protect other fundamental rights. That's just some perspective that I was looking at when I was doing some research. And so um, when, I, when I come back, I'm already four minutes in, I do want to talk about what I've found at the Brennan Justice Center at the Iowa ACLU and some, uh, and some other things that help us uh, think about what 30 days of storage means. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to kind of counteract a little bit of what uh, Mr. Resnick said. My doctor says I need more exercise, so I've been walking around my neighborhood. Um, I've decided to walk about 10 blocks around my neighborhood. So if I walk from my house down to 14th Street on Jackson, there's about 146 homes. There are close to 70 private cameras on apartment buildings, businesses, and homes that are just show, shining on you while you're walking down the sidewalk. That's 10 blocks alone. And so I got to thinking about this. Well, what are these people doing with this information? Where is the accountability of that? What is big tech doing with that? Um, so I feel like our policy that we've created has, it's, it's kind of keeping those checks and balances for folks that feel uneasy about this. And so I'm fully in support of this policy. Um, <coughs> Like I said, when you start walking around your neighborhoods and you start noticing all the, the, the cameras people have put up, you wonder what are folks doing with that data and really what's big tech doing with that. So I'm, like I said, fully in support of this. So thank Mr. you. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber, go ahead. If I may just add to that. Um, so remember I mentioned that this was a passive system and it takes a picture of a license plate. First and foremost, a license plate is registered. So we already have that information in our databases in the city and in the police department or whoever does uh, the registrar's office. So I think um, that we all know that we are tagged by our license plate. Okay, but for the, um, the innovation and the intelligence of the system, which is focused on that license plate, there's no more information behind that um, unless it's identified through the NCIC system as a crime and therefore would require additional delving into uh, information by that. But the machine itself, the system itself, does not have all that information. It just has the license plate. So from a technology perspective, it's an image, if you will, with a little bit of data behind it. And I had mentioned cybersecurity and privacy before, but based on this system, which is very low key, it does get um, deleted every 30 days per the standard for the um, interstate FBI and all the uh, federal systems throughout the United States. So I just wanted to clarify that, that this is not um, big brother, as some people would say it, uh, and it is not um, overly delving into um, things that other kinds of artificial intelligence can do based upon what we've seen with social media and some other things that are concerned. And that's what Congress is looking at right now to provide guidelines. And so the NLC is looking to provide guidelines for municipalities to help us through issues like this. And we did talk about, believe it or not, the um, 
the systems here for license plate readers and a lot of um, municipalities do use it and they're very comfortable with it as a trustworthy platform. Thank you. Ms. Roussel, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think we all want to live in a safe community and I think Mr. Jones um, summed it up very well. Um, I feel this is a technology that can make our community safer and our officers more efficient. Um, if, a, if a vehicle associated with a missing person or a crime comes to our community, I want to know, and quickly, with, with those real-time alerts, I, I think it will help us solve and prevent crime. Um, the, I think it's important that the policy that's been laid out <clears throat> has best practice language from the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which um, I thought was um, good to know. Um, I believe that the proposed placement of these cameras will clearly capture the places where um, those people of concern may be entering or leaving our community. Um, I did see in one of the documents that there was a, um, a suggestion for a yearly review, and I thought that was good. And I wondered if, um, with this kind of a contract, if there's a specific commitment that we'd have to make. Um, so if, if in a year we looked at it and we decided that it wasn't providing the uh, return on investment that we hoped it would, which I don't know why it wouldn't, but are these the kinds of things that um, you know, we would look at and see you know, how is this performing for us and, and is that kind of your thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. I mean, we want to look at review it and see where, where things at. And, and one of the parts we built in is the transparency portal to see how much it's using. And the public can see that. And that, that's the outward facing to see how much it's, it's being used. Again, there's stuff we can't release, you know, because of, of, of privacy concerns. Uh, but when how much we're using. But it, it, there is a constant review. I, and that's the one thing I, I think we do at the police department is we look at things and say, yeah, that's not working or that is working. And and. and to adapt or shift from that. And as far as contracts, you write contracts, you know, for a reason with a term life so you can review those, uh -huh. you know. So can, can you give us a little insight into um, exactly how is this data used? So we've got this 30 day block of information um, and it said that um, it can be, um, you can access it by accompanying a law enforcement case number or, um, so when would someone go into the system to, to look, or would you just be in there looking around to see what's happening? No, <clears throat> no. It, as we said in the policy, there has to be a law enforcement purpose tied to it. And so generally, it's, it's, if we're looking in there, it's reactive side that, or we get an alert. So we get an alert on a notification that something's already in the system, NCIC, Iowa system, and that has happened here in Dubuque. That's what brought this to our attention. Um, that this is how this works. The other side of it is, so I'll give you an example. So say you go on vacation for two weeks and you come back and your car has been damaged, you know, a hit and run or say parts are missing off of it. Um, as we start to use our, our camera system to say, okay, now it's two weeks ago, so let's go back and look. We have our current camera system, but then do we see where this vehicle, did it ping off of one of these other, did it leave town, the, the suspect vehicle, if we can identify what that is. Maybe your neighbor got a license plate, you know, and said, hey, you know, this car was here, or our partial on that, where we can start piecing that together. That's where back data helps us to go into, we don't got the time to sit there and go through and look for every person that's in there and see what they're up to. We really don't, uh, nor do we want to. Um, it, is, it is very labor intensive to look at cameras how it is. Um, we use it, again, very effectively for crime, and, and that's what we really are looking for with this. Um, again, this is not, these cameras won't help us with like accident investigation, which our current cameras do. You know, that's looking to what happened. These cameras are more of that, you know, as, as alluded to before. We're looking for that wanted person. We're looking for something associated with the crime. Say we know they had a shooting happen here, and we know a license plate. Now we want to know where that vehicle went very efficiently and quickly. You know, if we know that vehicle left town, we know we can put our resources back into here for now, alert other agencies of what's going on. Uh, the beauty of the flock system is if it goes down towards one of the other flock cameras, it'll get notified that it goes through that in another jurisdiction. And so we'll have some real time 
potentially where the, it's going and be able to catch somebody um, as they're moving. Criminals are mobile. Mobile. They, they do not sit static. Yeah, this is, they move all over the country now, and that's one of the things that the benefit of this system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead. I just want to ask some questions, which the information was provided, but I want to make sure that um, folks at home who are listening hear some of these responses because they've been a, no a number of questions voiced to me through email that I've tried to respond to, but I want to make sure it's answered. Um, the first is, does this record a vehicle's speed? No. I'd like you to talk just a little bit further in discussion of compliance monitoring and what that, that will look like as far as who is accessing the data. We've already learned you have to have the ability through the NCIC to access it. But in as far as going to make sure we are in compliance with the policy here, would you speak just briefly or at length about yeah. how that will look? It, it's actually, it's fairly simple, it keeps a log. It keeps a log of who uses it, who accesses it, and what for. Like I said in the policy, it has to have a case number assigned to it. So that means we're generating something has happened. Um, the other part of that is that, and the way the policy is written is again that me or my designee will be reviewing this on a, on a frequent basis. Um, we already do like arrest audits. We do monthly arrest audits. Um, so we have audits built all over our system. The Iowa system audits what officers are accessing already. Um, part of the Iowa system too, and, and, and if an officer misuses it, we have to report it. And they get banned from it. And this is a big part of our job to do that. So uh, it's very serious business, quite honestly, that we aren't misusing it. Um, and that it's a big part of the test we take. I don't remember it's every two years, every three years to, to maintain this, but that's a huge part of it is the integrity of that and what we do with the data. Thank you. So in my line of work in healthcare, Anyone who accesses healthcare um, as a patient signs a document that says, I understand HIPAA and I am signing this and that is how I'm going to access my healthcare. And then there is a professional integrity that is expected of <coughs> me and my colleagues that work in the healthcare setting that I will only look up the patients that I am dealing with and it would be inappropriate and I would be fired if I were to look up my family member, my neighbor. If I am not caring for someone, I do not access their medical record. And there are checks and balances within our electronic medical record to ensure that no one breaches that agreement. And it's a level of integrity and professionalism that holds that bar. And so, the document tonight confirms the expectation of how our officers will honor the policy with integrity. And at the end of the day, we need to remember that our officers right now have a crime clearance rate of 85% compared to a national average of, I believe, 45%. And that is the people that use the technology and skills that we give them. But what I have heard in presentations by yourself and others in the department is that this is a necessity. This isn't an option, this is a necessity because your professional goal when you leave your house every day and you leave your family and you put your life on the line for your community, we wanna give you the tools to have you come home safe. And so if we keep people out of our community who are potentially coming here related to gun violence, drug trafficking, human trafficking, those are people that could harm our community and you. And so when you say, this is something we need to keep you safe and do our job and come home to our family at night, then it's my job to give that to you. I do ask that we have a consistent report to council and maybe even as legally appropriate some case study models that you would present to us of, I'd like to show you what we've done with this data. Now, us as a community, of course, 
there are other communities that will benefit from our access to this technology as well. But I would like to have your feedback on what kind of a timeline you think after execution of this plan, if it's so passed tonight, that would be an appropriate thing to do. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't know the exact answer to that because I don't know how, from what I hear from other departments, we're going to start seeing results right away. Uh, but again, I don't exactly know that. Uh, as a timeline, my goal was to present on this. Part of the policy rewrite was to add this yearly check-in of the policy as part of this, which is, is, is the last, last line, not just me looking at it, but different departments and legal um, reviewing that. So I guess it would be what you would ask for, for me to come back and present on. And it's very easy to present on cases. Uh, you know, we've talked about several here without revealing the, the privacy data, but yeah, definitely can do that and whatever you would, you would like. I would think that that's a discussion we could have tonight to ensure our community that this is something that if we would move forward with it this evening, we take their concerns of privacy and the use of the cameras seriously and that having a presentation to us at council and in essence to our community would be a way for us to kind of circle back on some of those concerns that have been voiced to myself and I know others. Thank you. I'm going to jump in before I let anybody else go because um, this, this is a great discussion and it's a continuation, as Mike pointed out, of many discussions that we've had on this. Um, I, you know, one person that reached out to us, um, the specific words she used were to slow walk this and, and my response to her is going to be, because I haven't had a chance to respond to her, is that we have definitely slow walked this one. I mean, we have taken the time to have this discussion and make sure that we're answering the questions that we, that we have here. Um, so I've made it pretty clear in my discussion of this before what my concerns are, and it's the privacy concerns. And um, I wanna start by saying privacy concerns are extremely legitimate concerns in a healthy democracy. You, you better have them if you want your democracy to stay healthy. We see democracies that aren't healthy throughout the world, and we see examples, bad ones, I'm not gonna name countries, but you can think of them, where we have seen technology being used in a way to abuse citizens people who have not broken the law, people who are um, being abused because of who they are, because of what religion they practice, all those things. It is extremely legitimate, incredibly legitimate to have those concerns today. Now, with that said, those concerns need to be addressed. And those have been, the, the types of concerns that people address about privacy are, have been my number one concerns with this technology. Um, I don't worry about the AI of it. It's gonna work great. I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a pretty effective tool that we can, that we can use. And I'm pretty sure it is gonna be very passive as, as Ms. Farber is pointing out. It's gonna do its job very specifically. I'm not concerned about the system. I'm concerned about the way that people can abuse it. And I wanna make it really clear that I'm not saying that there's anybody within our police department who I think is going to abuse this right now. I absolutely don't think so. But we all know human beings and we know that that kind of stuff can happen. So a job for us, in my opinion, is to make sure that whatever policy we put in place protects the humans from the other humans, <laughs> the people who are doing this, who could be abusive in their power. Because that can absolutely happen with a system like this. You can abuse power. So what you need to do, and what I've asked for up to this point, is to write a clear policy that will address those concerns. And I gotta tell you, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I really think that you have addressed that. And, and I know you've done it in combination, I think, with engineering, city attorney's office. I think that you have created a policy here that addresses the concerns that, that we have voiced over and over again throughout these discussions. Um, I don't think that that closes all the doors to discussion about this in the future and the ways in which we use the data. Uh, I, I'm gonna go back to Mr. Resnick in a second. He already alluded to the fact that he wants to talk about the amount of time that we keep this. I think, that's a, I think that's a legitimate discussion to have. At this point, however, I think that 30 days is actually appropriate. I think it is a good place to start. And I think it's in line with one of the, some of the things I'm reading from the um, American Civil Liberties Union, uh, Brennan Center for Justice, and other places that you've kind of built this policy around, along with the ones that you've, you've mentioned within the documents. Just a few, few high, highlights, I think. Um, uh, so, Clear rules, this has, I think this policy that we're looking at has clear rules for procedures for accessing the system. You've talked about that, who can do it, when they can do it, why they can do it, how that's gonna get done. Clear rules for storing data on, of innocent people, 30 days, that's it. If you, if you haven't done anything wrong, you're, you're, you're not in the system at all, then you're, that system is going to be purged every 30 days and we're not gonna be keeping data on innocent people. 
Um, clear procedures for auditing, which you've already talked about. Public oversight. Not only are we going to have more reports to city council in a forum like this, but you're going to put something on a website that talks about who's logging in or how it's being used and what's being logged and that kind of stuff. Um, I think you have been very responsive to the concerns that the ACLU and the Brandon Center point out and other organizations like them. I think you've addressed things like um, uh, the, there's concerns about disparate impact and things like that of, uh, of people of, of certain races or religions or anything like that. The placement that we have of these cameras is very equitable. It's going to be in the same points coming into the city from all kinds of places. It's not in particular neighborhoods. We're talking about at the edge of, of where we are as a city. I do have a couple of questions, um, and then I'll open it back up for a little bit more discussion here. Uh, so first of all, what about error rates? Are we going to be tracking error rates on this as we do the audits? Because these systems aren't perfect. Sometimes they actually um, will identify a car that is no longer on the hot list or something happened there. And you know, how are you going to make sure that we're looking at error rates to make sure that we're happy with what we're seeing? Yeah, it, and error rates are not just the system itself. Because it could be that a vehicle is recovered and nobody took it out of NCIC. Sure. <laughs> you know, uh, there's the same thing with wanted persons. Um, we run into that now. The this, this same thing. You run a plate and you like that person's wanted, go and go. But there's checks and balances of a, a lot of this. So, to answer your question about the system itself, that's part of working with the vendor, the, the error rates and that. But the second part of that is the officer, it still requires an officer visual. So, I get a hit on a vehicle and it says, this plate's this. And it's right here and I look at it and say, that doesn't match. You know, that, that's part of, the, part of this too. That's part of the officers. They're not just acting blindly on it. Again, it's, it's vehicle related. The other part of that is, say, this vehicle here and the wanted subject is a male. It's obviously a female driving. That, that still doesn't give us a, a, a right to act. We still have to have that ability to match that up. Just because the vehicle says the male that owns this is wanted, but that is not the male. Or whatever other identifier you want to pick, it doesn't match. That's the officer verification of the system with that. But obviously, there's, again, with the vendor themselves having their, their error rate, um, <coughs> And, and they have a vested interest in being accurate, because if they're not, they're not going to be in business. And so that's part of this, too. But I, and that's part of us checks and balancing that also to make sure that um, we're not having high error rates or we have you know, cameras that aren't reading right or, or that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that's back to the, the question about you know, are we checking this uh, frequently? You know, are we making sure that this is doing what we want it to do? There's no value to us if it's not accurate. So it will be a part of the regular yeah. auditing system that you're going to be putting in place to, be able to check for the errors and not not only system errors but human errors. If yes. You use it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, there's also one one other lingering question I have. I, you kind of alluded to it in in the documents you gave us. And by the way, for anybody in the public, there are a lot of documents attached to this agenda item that explain a lot about what this is. A lot of the questions that I received from people on emails this week are answered within the documents themselves. But one that I'm not entirely clear on is. How will we share this data with any other entity? So uh, Dubuque County Sheriff's Department, um, State of Iowa, FBI, how will we share it with them? How will they ask for it? Are they going to need a warrant for things like that? Or how does that, that transfer of data? No, not, not a warrant. Away? So like now with our, our current camera system in, in Dubuque County, they just ask, and, and again, a legitimate purpose. That's our check and balance. They come in and say, hey, run this plate. We, why? You know, what, what is going on? We have to still, the same policy applies. We still have to apply our policy to it. Now with other agencies, so like for us, we put something in there. What will happen is we'll get notified if it, it triggers a plot camera clint and it triggers it. We'll get notified that it did that. Now in order to access their data, we have to request that. There has to be a request made. It doesn't just happen automatically. Now the Clinton police officers on the Clinton or on the system on the flock system, we'll get notified, hey, this stolen vehicle or whatever, the NCIC thing, is in your town and here's where it's at. Uh, but in order to actually access the data that goes with it or the video that goes with it, they have to make a request. It's not automatic. And it's, so it's a request that's made and it needs to be in line with our policy that we have. So if that's they made correct. a request that's out of line, like, you know, you wouldn't give that to another officer in the Dubuque Police Department if the request, request was made for that reason, for example. Right, and, and the prime example, and I think somebody had said this too, is that, you know, right now I could run a license plate to all my kids and my wife and all that. I can't do that in the system. That will get me kicked out of the system and, and cause problems, which I could be fired for. Same thing with this. If, if we have that and an officer misuses it or say, hey, go check this, this certain person. And, and to kind of reassure people, in, in my 29 years, I've known of that happening once where 
where an officer uh, years ago ran a play to somebody they shouldn't have run on that. And so to kind of give you, and I don't know how many thousands upon thousands of license plates we run per year, you know, within that, so. I think you made a really important point right there. Okay, so um, before I open it back up, I just want to say we, we got a long agenda yet. This has been a really good discussion. I do want to keep it going just to make sure that anybody has any final questions or points they want to make, um, because I, I do want. I think this is an important enough issue to do that. But I would ask us to to keep it moving as we go forward. And I'll close up by saying, um, to Miss Wethel's point, I think a six month report to us for this first year would be really helpful I, for the whole public. I think it would be really good to know what's going on, even if it's not that much yet just to know what's going on within six months. I think that could be helpful. And that, that would be my, because I, I think it's realistic based on, um, hopefully, you know, based on the, the system implementation and things like that. From what I'm seeing right now, um, and, and I, I, have been, I have been very undecided on this issue for un, until you gave us this documentation to be able to show us what this policy is really gonna look like. I wanted to make sure the policy was gonna be in line with the concerns that I had and the things that I had been reading. And I, I see it that it is. So I, I plan to vote for this tonight and, and move this forward. And, and we'll, we'll put it in place and see how it works as long as everybody agrees to do that. So um, that's kind of where I'm sitting right now. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Jones, come to you first. Yeah, just, just three quick points. Uh, right now when a major crime is committed, report a shots fired or something, the practice is to swarm the area. As many cars as are available, go to that general area and they look for whatever, was re whatever we reported to be looking for. And during that time that vehicles are, that just about every unit in town is swarming that area, Nothing else is happening law enforcement wise. There's nobody working radar anywhere. There's nobody taking a report anywhere. There's nobody responding to the less high priority call. People are waiting. People are not getting law enforcement service. But if we know that that vehicle left town on Highway 20 15 minutes ago, we don't need to swarm anymore. Um, we, can, we can call that part off and get on with the investigation, get everybody out, else on with the rest of their, their business. Um, Point number two I want to make is the NCIS is one of the most trusted instruments in the world. Um, it is the backbone of law enforcement for the FBI, the, um, the, the state patrols in all 50 states and, and every city, police department, sheriff's department and constable in, in the entire nation. And the safeguards to get into it are substantial. There's a, there is a certification process. Um, it is uh, very well protected data and the breaches are, are few and far between. Um, even on the on the cop shows, on an NYPD blue show, you'll see somebody got in big trouble for running a plate that they weren't supposed to. It, it got found out. Now that's that's fantasy, but it's based on reality. Um, it's not something you mess with. It's not something that uh, that people can get at. Um, the last point I want to make is that about 100 years ago, state legislatures started recognizing that people were motorizing vehicles and causing some problems with them sometimes and they started to require license plates. And the idea of the license plate was to link the owner of the vehicle to whatever problem the, the operator of that vehicle caused. And they were intended to be public, they were intended to be large, they were intended, um, in 50, all 50 states, you're required to have a full-size license plate on the rear of the vehicle, it has to be illuminated at night. This is the reason for finding people that have, that have done things that they shouldn't have done. 30 of those 50 states require front and back license plates, I was one of them. Um, that's a, that's an important thing. This is what we're looking at as license plates. Not faces, not individuals, license plates. And it's just another tool to do enforcement that you're already expected to do based on license plates being on cars that have been involved in criminal activity. The expectation is that we're gonna find them and arrest them and put them and take care of business. The reality is that if we've only got a dozen cops on the street and thousands of cars going every which direction and calls for service picking up so you're not patrolling, you're responding all day long almost for, for a lot of officers, um, not a lot of looking go happens for the, for the routine stolen vehicle that's on the list, it has been for a few days, um, unless something flags you to it. And that's, that's one of the reasons this is important. Lastly, uh, we heard a, a great quote about privacy, but it sure sounded like he's concerned about personal identifiable information <coughs> like we talk about in healthcare, We're talking about identity theft and other things. This is none of that. This is law enforcement agencies enforcing motor vehicle law and using the tools of the trade to, to solve crimes. And that's kind of what we hired you guys all for. Um, a friend of mine years and years and years ago uh, was a police officer patrolling downtown 
and he found a nightstick in a trunk downstairs. Nobody was wearing nightsticks. He bought a loop and put it on his belt. Showed up to work the next day. Chief called him in the next day and said, people say you look like you're looking for trouble. His answer was, well, what was I supposed to be looking for? That's what this is for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, by the way, you can tell a whole lot about somebody, their personal privacy, by, by the information about where they've driven in the day. If you know where I drove today, you know exactly what I believe in, you know exactly what I need to do, and my regular routine. There's a whole lot of information. I do want to say that uh, Illinois passed a bill just this summer, the legislature, to ensure that police cannot use data from license plate scanners to track people traveling into Illinois for women's health care or because of immigration status. And I always think about how I, the state of Iowa has trumped what, we're, what we've been doing and, uh, and taken over. So that's uh, just something uh, I chatted about with our city attorney briefly. Uh, but I mean, some people are being proactive. Now, I want to talk about my primary concern, which is citizen concern about privacy. And um, I'm all for real-time alerts, Mr. Russell talked about real-time alerts. I'm all for that. We're here not just to talk about the camera, about the policy. Now, if the, if the policy was, hey, we're just going to uh, have these cameras, and if it pops up that there's a problem here with this car, and uh, we're going to address it right now, or you know, very soon today. Well, that's one thing. But when 99 and a half percent of people are just going about their daily business, why are we why are we uh, using keeping this for 30 days? I asked the flock representative that very same question: Why are we doing this for 30 days? I posed this, uh, and he posed a scenario where people come home from vacation to to find a break in. And this, this license plate reading system is not some kind of pseudo home security system, right? Uh, and Mr. Sprank mentioned that all of these ring, uh, you know, they have these personal devices. And the Dubuque Police Department already has a program, don't they, where we partner with homeowners and using security footage. It's called Secure Dubuque, correct? Yes. So we already have something that would be far more, far superior than a license plate reader to help uh, solve crime at somebody's house. Uh, you know, uh, property crime. Okay, so the mayor mentioned the Brennan Center for Justice and the Iowa ACLU, but let me fill in a couple of things that I, I don't know if he read the same thing that I did. Um, so the Brennan Center for Justice, they say that the proliferation of ALPR technology raises serious civil rights, civil liberties, and disparate impact concerns. You mentioned that. But what they recommend is that plates that are scanned and do not match a hot list alerts should be promptly discarded. I mean, why are we keeping these, uh, the records of people who are, are not? Uh, and I agree with the Iowa ACLU. He mentioned that. And that when used in a narrow and carefully regulated way, these cameras can help a police recover stolen cars and arrest people with outstanding warrants. Ding, yes. That is real-time alert. <coughs> the biggest problem, I'm continuing with their statement that I agree with, the biggest problem with these systems is the creation of databases with location information on every motorist who encounters the system, not just those whom the government suspects of criminal activity. They applaud New Hampshire as a statute that states that this data shall be purged from the system when th within three minutes of their capture unless that number that uh, has been retrieved results in arrest, a citation, or protective custody, uh, custody or identified a vehicle that was the subject of a missing or wanted person broadcast. That's what I agree with. I, I'm, I, I think they would be a great crime tool to fight. If it pings something like, oh, here they are, there they are. We, we get this, uh, but to keep 99% of the people in there who don't wish to be tracked, there's no reason to do it. You, I don't want to say just in case. We're going to really hold the data for that long? Anyway, so my concern is why we, I didn't get a, an answer that, I mean, it was, it was a correct answer, but 
I, I didn't like the answer because I didn't think it was uh, worthy of keeping all that data, travel data, that, you know, this is a private company. It's been mentioned by the Iowa ACLU that, you know, we're, we're partnering with them and we don't really know what's going on and they can change and, and somebody's already mentioned that tonight. But it just gets messier. If it was just the Dubuque police, uh, you know, it'd be a minimal concern. There's lots of things going on, lots of moving parts. It's getting a lot bigger system. They're making money off of this tying things together. You know, you come up from Clinton or you go to St. Louis and, you know, that's they sell cameras with that kind of advertisement. I don't, I think that we should, final statement, Mr. Mayor, I think that we should get these cameras and adjust the policy to at the most uh, save that data on everybody for a day or two. It doesn't need to be 30 days. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank, first, I'm, I'm going to really go around. Go ahead. Um, there's been three homicides in Dubuque this year so far, if I'm not mistaken. At least in my neighborhood, I know for sure. Two. Okay, two. Thank you. Um, the, first, the one on Central, though, wasn't that perpetrator a felon already, and wasn't he had priors? The one from last year? <laughs> yeah, on yes. Central, yes. Yes. So if his car would have came into town, which it did, and he was in the system... It would have flagged us, you would have been notified, and potentially you could have arrested him prior, possibly prior to anything happening. Yeah, if he had warrants. Because he, yeah. he did have warrants. Yeah, I don't remember right offhand, okay. but that, okay. but yeah, there was there was history there. Okay. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Anybody else before Mr. Jones goes again? Go ahead, Mr. Jones. Sometimes it's not a crime against property. Sometimes it's a body that was discovered that's two or three or four weeks old. And uh, an active homicide investigation gets built around that finding. And if you no longer have the data that might have helped you solve that crime, you're kind of remiss. When you have the data and you have good governing policy like we're about to pass, um, I don't think that's the problem as long as it's being reviewed and looked at. Nobody has got the time to, to look and see where Rick Jones is going at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. Unless Rick Jones did something at 3 o'clock on Tuesday that, that seriously drew himself to your attention. So I, 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 I certainly respect the... I'm not without concern about the civil rights implications of doing this. Um, but I truly don't think there are many. And I think the, the good outweighs the bad dramatically. Dramatically. Um, this is a tool to arrest dangerous people. It's not a tool to harass Joe Sixpack walking down the street. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, yep, just one question. So if there is an offender and you put him in the system and you extend the um, information database past 30 days, it might be interesting for us to know at our <clears throat> updates how long those kinds of crime-based or uh, missing children or uh, whatever the offense might be, how long those um, images are kept within the system in order to help the um, law enforcement side of things. Yeah, to, to be clear, so if we entered an NCIC until we take it out, it's in there, just on that. The camera system, I just want to make clear that that's a separate thing. So the camera itself, we put that plate in and extend it because we're trying to, to do it. But in that case, um, yeah, it, it would that vehicle would be on the hot list, so it would expend, again, the 99% is purged. And then does Flock really have more information, perhaps, to um, share with us about the um, decision that was made to keep it for 30 days? I mean, is there a magical reason for, um, or a statistical reason, or for an audit, or w why the 30 days? Yeah, it, and what they recommended to me is whatever we, we wanted to pick on it. I, oh, so. I will, to, to, to Mr. Jones' point, I would love if crimes happened right now and I got reported in real time and I didn't have to go back and try to recreate no, the wheel two to three weeks later. Sure. That would be awesome. Um, but yeah, they, they just said this is kind of what everybody's doing, looking at other policies, um, and again, not, giving you some investigative leeway to give you some time, but also not keeping it forever, you know, and you know, keeping it for extended periods. So perhaps over time, as we have these reports, I mean, this is really something that is alive and evolving that maybe we would be able to adjust that figure or extend that figure of days, depending upon what you come up with for the actual data that's collected. So maybe we just keep that as an open question um, as we are moving forward with the policy as, it, again, it will be... Um, 
updated on a regular basis, hopefully. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mayor. I'm gonna, oh, go ahead, Mike. I, I'd just like to add one little tiny point. Yep. Our, our current policy is 30-day retention for our own uh, security and traffic camera system. Thank you. All right, we have had a great discussion. I, I wanna thank you all for this. Um, Chief, I wanna thank you, you've been on your feet for a long time. Thank you very much for, for um, working with us tonight and answering these questions so patiently and completely. So the motion is to receive and file and approve the current policy that is in front of us right now. Uh, the motion was made by Farber, second by Jones. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? No. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 1. <clears throat> Action item number four is a ward of JFK and West 32nd Street intersection improvement project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. I got a motion by Resnick, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Zahoyas is recommending City Council award the construction contract for the John F. Kennedy Road and West 32nd Street intersection improvement project to Eastern Iowa Excavating and Concrete the amount of $416,195.45 through the adoption of the enclosed resolution. The project provides for the construction of a new four-legged intersection with traffic signals at John F. Kennedy Road and West 32nd Street. This intersection will include new traffic signals and mast arms for improved visibility of the traffic signals, ADA pedestrian access ramps, related sidewalk, turn lane, and pavement widening work. Additionally, storm sewer intakes will be reconstructed. Traffic on John F. Kennedy Road and West 32nd Street will be maintained through the intersection during construction as much as possible. I concur with the recommendation and respect for the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Question? Ms. Roussel. Thank you. Um, since I just live a couple blocks, a couple blocks from that intersection, and I've been talking to some of my neighbors and um, I guess I just wondered if you could help us understand, um, better understand how those two lights would be coordinated to improve the traffic flow and how that might be monitored as the, you know, as we work through that new intersection. Uh, Gus Ahoya, city engineer. So we will have the um, two signals, the one both at JFK and 32nd and also the Northwest Arterial tied with fiber and uh, we'll be able to check how it's um, functioning with our camera system, and uh, they'll be able to uh, tweak uh, coordination between the two signals and make sure that they're designed and uh, operate efficiently. So our traffic engineers will take care of that. Great, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. So Gus, we're gonna be implementing the street program. Uh, John Ravada, our transportation planner for ECIA DMATS has been working on that for years. And I believe it's supposed to be implemented by the end of the year. Um, and that's basically an artificial intelligence system to coordinate traffic signals under all weather conditions, traffic conditions, traffic accidents, whatever, adjusting times to make sure everything's running as efficiently as possible. Are these signals gonna be tied into that system? I'd have to check with Dave, but um, I'm assuming all the signals that can be um, coordinated and tied in together would be. So I'd just have to check the specific one. All right. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Any others? All right, motion here is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Uh, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number five is update on Water Resource Recovery Center odor abatement efforts. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file. Second. Motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Um, Willie, am I coming right to you? All right. Yes. Good evening, Mayor Kavanaugh and city council members. I'm Willie O'Brien, uh, manager of the city's Water and Resource Recovery Center, and I'm here to provide a brief update on our odor reduction work at the center. <clears throat> in 
In July, we entered an agreement with a company called USP Technologies. They're a, a specialist in the wastewater industry that focuses on odor reduction, um, generally using uh, chemicals. Um, I think uh, they specialize in oxidants like hydrogen peroxide and um, things of that nature. Um, the agreement with the company uh, provides chemicals and technical services. Um, we were able to kick the project off in mid-July uh, with a site visit where they came, uh, one of their technicians, the project manager actually, who uh, resides in Davenport, came up uh, to conduct some testing on different waste streams at different points in the process, and also install what he calls a, an ODA logger. It's a, a sensor that measures hydrogen sulfide level, and so he wanted to install those at two different points of the plant to get some preliminary data before treatment so we could measure the uh, fluctuations in hydrogen sulfide throughout the day. Um, after the site visit, um, the company ordered some hydrogen peroxide. Uh, about We decided to go with totes. We ordered a full semi-load, which is 13 um, totes, 300 gallons a piece, roughly. Um, because of the portability of them, uh, at this point, while we're early in the, in the project, we're thinking we're going to move some of the injection points around so these are portable and they allow us to do that. Uh, they installed a chemical feed system, uh, and then they began feeding peroxide on Monday, July 24th, um, although shortly thereafter, there was a mechanical failure of a specialized piece of a, uh, was a connection that's special to the pump they were using, so they had to order some replacements. And then we were able to resume feeding on Monday, July 31st, and we've been feeding um, hydrogen peroxide into the system consistently since then. And um, just wanted to uh, relay some of our observations. We have some preliminary data, um, and the way we're looking at the effectiveness of that hydrogen peroxide um, dosing is by looking at the um, concentrations of hydrogen sulfide before um, upstream and then after the, the dosing point. And we look at the average, uh, averages of the minimum, maximum, I don't know if this makes sense, but the average of the average. So each day we have an average concentration, each day we have a minimum concentration and a maximum concentration. And we're looking at the reductions in those over a period of time. And so we've seen about a 30% um, decrease in the average and the, the points that we put the ODA loggers is right at the headworks um, and then um, right at the entrance to the primary clarifiers. And we're looking at actually moving the, the dosing point upstream a little bit. We just need to acquire some, uh, which has been ordered, some stainless steel tubing, which will allow us to get up where the wastewater first enters the plant rather than about 50 feet downstream from there. That'll provide some more contact time, and hopefully we'll see some additional reduction with that move of that injection point. Um, the week of August 21st, we are going to have a specialist with the company uh, come on site for a more in-depth uh, evaluation of different waste streams to look at where we're injecting now um, and options for moving that injection point, potentially even using different types of chemicals uh, to get the best reduction for uh, the value that we can. Um, let's see. And then additional uh, things we're going to be doing. You know, right now we're early on in the process. We're trying to learn as much as we can about these chemicals and how they respond, how our system responds to them. Um, but we'll be looking at additional technologies. Uh, they, one of the things that was mentioned by USP was uh, potentially installing what is called an ozone generator. So that would be a capital expense, uh, at, which would likely have a lower operating cost over time. But once we identify where we could use it in the system, we can start looking at, you know, what is the cost of a system like that and would it make sense for us. Um, and then we'll be pro providing additional updates. Um, I don't have a specific time frame, but you're, you will be seeing more updates before um, we go through the budget process. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Willie. Questions, Mr. Resnick, go ahead. Briefly, so I'm glad you got the numbers and the data, but anecdotally, have you noticed a difference? 
I have noticed a difference, and particularly near the headwork structure. Um, and I will say that the points that we're measuring the hydrogen sulfide at, I don't know that that tells the, the full story yet, um, because we're only measuring that reduction uh, when it's going into the primary clarifiers and not what's coming out of the primary clarifiers. So we have some more data to collect on reduction uh, there. But I feel like I can notice a difference. Um, great, and it and sounds others. like a great idea to put it in sooner and right away, and that'll help, you know, everything, uh, like you say, longer. And uh, so my, my father was down at the plant in Davenport, and he, didn't notice it after a while, so I just wondered if if you may if you notice a difference. I, yeah, I think uh, you know those that work in the industry we become somewhat nose blind after a while. But um, <laughs> we've had several staff that have said they've noticed a difference. Um, and I was talking about different injection points. We are looking at potentially injecting upstream in the collection system, which would provide even more contact time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Barber, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you very much as I live on that corridor and I um, anecdotally um, breathe better air these days. And I haven't really had any case and comment from some of the um, residents that actually live down in that cul-de-sac area uh, by Mount Carmel uh, and absolutely no comment from the Bluffs um, people either. So I think that's a good first step. Um, I'm greatly appreciative of all the time and attention that has been given to this project and to the concerns. Um, and I just think it's really important to have the clean, healthy air, uh, and especially for the young ladies that play baseball or softball down there too. Um, as I think it's important for that facility and then for um, all the people that walk and bike along Grandview. Uh, I think it's just really important for, for the uh, welcoming corridor, if you will, in Dubuque. So I am greatly appreciative and I look forward to the next um, uh, update. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I just wanted a quick mention uh, um, technology components. So these OTA logging devices that this company is supplying for the project, they have a built-in uh, 4G modem that they can get data off of. And so I'm looking at potentially acquiring some of these that we could put out in the system. Um, mm -hmm. I believe they make some that ha have a fine enough resolution that could measure in the parts per billion. So you can potentially hang them out, you know, up in a tree or on a street light or something where we could move them around and get a sense on, you know, what's the concentration emanating from the plant. So that's something I'm looking at. Oh, fabulous, thank you. <laughs> like a bad house. Ms. Wethel. July 19th was my last um, concern voiced to me by a constituent. And so, um, fingers crossed that not only the particulates are changing and reducing, but the odor will. And so I would ask, as I have before, any of my constituents, as you notice something, tell us, because Willie, you've been wonderful at responding to my constituents with their concerns directly. Um, we have to learn how what you're measuring translates into odor. Um, not that I don't trust your nose, but I think that really that's our end game, as uh, Councilwoman Farmer mentioned, is that this is about the long haul and the quality of our air and what we breathe. And so if we can start to translate, yes, what you see is yes, what constituents say, um, then we've hit the jackpot. So thank you for your work and um, to constituents who are out there, I do want them to continue to contact me when they have concerns and it's, it's a bad odor day for them. Thank you. Thank you. Great work, really. I mean, this has been a long time that you've been working on this, so thank you very much for working on it. I know that, you know, as, as conditions change, we have to make changes, and you've done it. Um, you've also taught us an incredible amount of, about chemistry and, and now a little math in the process. So we really, in, in all seriousness, though, we really do appreciate it. There's more to come. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there is. And that's what I also appreciate is that you keep working on it. So thank you very much for this, thank and thanks you. for the update. All right. Motion on this one was to receive and file. Uh, so, uh, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. 
Action item number six is Central Avenue Streetscape Master Plan Implementation Update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. Motion that we receive and file. Second. Motion by Sprank, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is sharing information about the status of the Central Avenue Corridor Streetscape Improvements. The Central Avenue Corridor Streetscape Master Plan was adapt adopted by the City Council on January 3rd, 2023 and is a 2022-2024 high priority for the City Council. And Jill is available here if you have any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. I'll just point out that all the updates are specifically listed in the document that's attached to the agenda here. Uh, involves a lot of different beautification efforts along with some talk about alley work. So questions or discussion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I'll just say it's pretty exciting to see this uh, finally getting to the launch pad. And uh, everything that I've seen is uh, really nice, really good. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Wethel. I know Council Member Sprank and I have both attended some um, Central Avenue meetings with business leaders, community um, activists, and, and residents. And um, this is going to be something that really adds to their quality of life. They have been um, hoping for this, and I'm glad to see it put into action. And I want to thank you, Ms. Connors, for your hard work on this and showing up to meetings and answering questions. And I would encourage all of those individuals who have advocated for Central Avenue to continue to do so. Tell us how this works out, where our placement is, and what we need to add along the way, because um, we're here to make that a really livable, walkable, wonderful place to be. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Spring. Thank you. Uh, echoing everything that's already been said, but just this is the start of a long project that I know is going to take a while, and I think this is the, the right step. So thank you for making it happen, and I'm sure everyone will appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah, same thing I was going to say. We're, we're not, this is the beginning here of, of some, uh, much more to come. So there's some good things. The, the talk about Central continues, and we will continue to have those discussions here. So thank you also for the work on this and all the community for chiming in. All right, the motion here is to receive and file. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number seven is free rides for college students. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and, and approve. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Director of Transportation Services Ryan Nucky is recommending City Council approval to eliminate bus fares for college students beginning on August 7th, 2023. Currently, college students pay the adult fare of $1.50 per ride. The Jewel is proposing eliminating the fare to, re to reflect our youth K through 12 student fare. Youth K through 12 ride the Jewel for free with an annual student pass. The students can utilize the pass to travel to school or any other bus stop in the city year round. In fiscal year 2023, there were a total of 943 rides picked up from the college bus stops. This equates to $1,414.50 in revenue. Allowing college students to ride for free would promote students using the Jewel on a more regular basis for entertainment and potential jobs. The lost revenue will be covered by the increase in FTA funding for the Jewel through the five-year infrastructure bill that was passed previously. College students can use the Jewel's mobile app or they will need to obtain a free college student pass at our intermodal facility at 950 Elm Street. These passes will be available starting mid-September 2023 due to supply chain issues. Till the college student passes arrive, college students can utilize the service free of charge without a pass or use the Jewel app. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval and Transit Operations Supervisor Jody Johnson is here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mike. Ms. Roussel. I'd just like to say thanks for a, a great idea. I think we should do everything we can to help our college students feel like Dubuque is their home. 
They will be our future leaders, and we want them to stay in our community. And this is just a, another thing that we can do for them. So thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> I, I agree. It's a fabulous idea. I'm glad we're doing it. Can't wait to say yes to it. Um, raises the question, could we ever afford to eliminate all ferries? Just have a free transit system? My answer to that would, question would be, we don't know. I, we could certainly, uh, Iowa City, I believe, does it, but they have a massively different transit system than we do with 35,000 college students and a, and a bigger population city than we have. Um, I don't think it's the answer is an absolute no. Um, and I don't want to derail this conversation tonight. We're doing a good thing and we should get it done. But, um, just want to plant that seed in the back of some minds. Mr. Sprank, go ahead. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we did have a similar program called this called the Night Rider, didn't we, years ago? That was like five, six years ago, I think? Yes, and, and this is not that. Okay. So we're not, this is just the regular jewel bus system. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Interesting questions. I mean, it's an interesting thing to think about. I think um, it sure helps when you have partnership from other levels of government. I mean, here we have federal government partnership that helps to cover the cost of something like this because it costs money to run buses. So we have to think about that. But uh, it is interesting to plant that seed and th think about it. How can you make it more effective for everybody? But at the very least, we're making it effective for a very important group of people in our community right now. That's the college students who come here. So, okay. Motion here is to receive and file and approve this plan. So Trish, would you call the roll, please? Russell. Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number eight is B Branch Stormwater Pumping Station, phase four of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project, project number 558650007. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Wethel. I ask to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Motion by Wethel, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council adopt the attached resolution approving the application for a U.S. Economic Development Administration or EDA grant in the amount of $7.7 .7 million dollars and pledging local matching funds in the amount of $19,012,000 for improvements associated with the B Branch Stormwater Pumping Station project. The total project costs are estimated at $29,338,400. To fund the project, funded in part with a $7.7 .7 million EDA grant, will require the city to provide an additional $5,228,400 for the project over our current uh, commitments. Even though the city currently has $8.9 million in stormwater utility funding for the project, the application illustrates that the city could issue debt in order to provide the matching funds for the grant. The city will know if its application for EDA funding is successful in the fall of 2023, so that if successful, the city will be able to consider how to best provide the additional project funding as part of the fiscal year 2025 budget process. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Questions, discussion? Well, Mr. Mayor, no, Mr. Th this is clearly a critical part of the B branch operations when we're buttoned up, when the flood wall's buttoned up, every drop of water that falls this side of it has to be pumped up and over and the B branch collects a big chunk of it. So, uh, did, we bid this before and weren't able to proceed with it because it was higher than, than available funds. Um, that, that made it unreachable right then, but it didn't make it unnecessary. So it's something we, we really need to move forward on. And this is a good direction to move forward on. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I find myself worrying about this particular spot. So I'm really glad that we're, we found another path forward with this. And it was a, a bit of a heartbreaker to not be able to move forward with that other EDA grant when uh, we knew that I mean, the, the, it just wasn't going to work. The, the cost was far too high, and we couldn't ask taxpayers to do that. So I think it's, um, I, I do think it's a, a very good thing to move this forward, and I'm really glad to see we did it. So thank you for everyone's work on it. 
All right, motion here is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Um, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number nine is safe routes to school project update. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file. Second by Sprank. A motion by Farber, second by Sprank. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is providing an update on the safe routes to schools activities that city staff are currently pursuing. The Safe Routes to Schools group held their first meeting on July 20th, 2023. Representatives were present from the Iowa Safe Routes to School Coordinator, Matt Berkby, the Dubuque Community School District, Executive Director of Student Services, Shirley Horseman, and Transportation Manager, Ernie Balaba, Holy Family Catholic Schools Chief Administrator, Philip Borman, DMATS ECIA Senior Planner, Dan Fox, and from the City of Dubuque, the Engineering Traffic Engineer, Justine Hall, from police, Lieutenant Bruce Deutsch, head of the school resource officers, public health director, Mary Rose Corrigan, transportation services manager, Ryan Nucky, and operations supervisor, Jody Johnson, from sustainability, climate action coordinator, Amanda Lewis, and from planning services assistant planner, <coughs> Jason Duba. The group discussed safe routes to schools concept, reviewed the 2009 Dubuque safe routes to schools plan, and discuss ways to update the plan and implement programs and improvements at elementary schools. The group is currently determining next steps, such as how to focus their efforts, how frequently to meet, and including other partners. Engineering staff were contacted by the principal of Bryant School to address the school crossing on South Grandview Avenue. Parents at the school are concerned with motorist behavior where cars would try and pass stopped vehicles on the right. This behavior is extremely dangerous as it resulted in several near misses. In response to these concerns, engineering staff designed a school crossing that utilizes curb bump outs to help narrow the roadway and prevent cars from passing stopped vehicles at the crosswalk. The abutting property owners near the crosswalk have been contacted and informed of the proposed crosswalk change. They are in full support of the proposed change. Engineering staff reviewed with the Bryan School principal and a school parent spokesperson on site to discuss changes. They are very supportive of the planned crosswalk change. Everyone contacted indicated a desire to have this crosswalk improved by the time school starts for orientation on August 21st, 2023. Engineering staff contacted a contractor who is working in the area and hired top grade excavating of Farley to remove the old crosswalk and construct a new crosswalk. The new crosswalk will be constructed and available for use by August 21st. The contractor was hired using the citywide contractor pricing. The city solicits its bids in the springs of each year. The new crosswalk will be ADA compliant. The existing rapid flashing crossing beacons at the old crosswalk will be moved to the new crosswalk location. The new bump outs at the crosswalk were designed with public works plows and sweepers in mind and will accommodate future bike lanes should they be installed on South Grandview Avenue in the future. Thank you, Mike. Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Barbara. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Shea Breitfelder uh, and the other parents and also the Bryant School administrators who came and spoke to the city council uh, about this issue. And um, I do live right around the corner from Bryant School, and so I'm seeing the work. I actually saw Gus the other day as I was driving by. Uh, and um, I think the whole community um, and Sam Comkills as well is part of that area for the school crossing. And I think all the kids and their parents are very happy uh, and will be very pleased with that safety feature uh, because it is very important. So thank you very much, Gus. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wethel, go ahead. And as it affects Councilwoman Farber's ward, it also affects uh, my community in Ward 4. And I think this is an excellent example of community, parents, children, administrators, teachers, saying, this is a problem. I'm going to contact my representatives, and we're going to come to a solution together. 
This is a perfect example of how community can access us so that we can access our talent at the city and get this done. So I'm so appreciative of the parents, um, everyone involved who've been such great advocates and certainly to our city staff who's been so responsive. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Resnick. Thank you very much. So I, first of all, appreciate the traffic calming solution uh, to that very uh, dangerous situation. Um, that we had talked about. My, I just want to let people know that what I hear most about is that um, Washington Middle School is very tricky for uh, safe routes to school. Um, a lot of traffic, a lot of kids, and it gets into a, and I, I hope the committee, whether it's the old or the new location, they just anticipate a lot of uh, issues there. So. Um, that's when I hear most about the parents say that it's not safe or uh, yeah, I'm backed up for three blocks trying to drop off my child. So, I mean, this is really important work uh, and I appreciate what's been done and I'd love to hear specifically what's going on with Washington Middle School, except we do have a school board for that. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So thank you very much to everybody who's done this. Um, parents and, and staff at Bryan involved, uh, for sure. Thank you for speaking up. And then thank you, uh, Gus, and the engineering department and everybody who was very responsive to their concerns. Um, we still have one group of people that need to hear what's going on here, and that's everybody who's driving. You gotta slow down. When kids are going to school, you, you just have to slow down. I, it doesn't really matter what you're late for at that point. Uh, you, there are kids walking to school, and you have to slow down. And yes, it is quite the bear dropping your kids off at Washington. I can attest to that. Got to slow down. Build some extra time into it. It's tough. It really is. This is a great uh, way to help people to do that, to slow them down as we go through the, the bump outs and that. I, I really appreciate this solution, so thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Let me just add a few comments as an old school bus driver, now retired. Um, <laughs> every single school causes a traffic jam twice a day. Most of them weren't, weren't designed with the thought of anybody coming to school other than on their feet or on a bus. And uh, Jefferson's probably the best example of, of the worst traffic situation in possibly North America. It's because the streets are skinny, and <laughs> when it was built, nobody was coming to school on wheels. But there it is, and it's just ugly. But every single one of them. But it's a 10-minute problem twice a day, maybe 15, and it all kind of goes away. So. So while I've got sympathy for the guy that's waiting three blocks deep to drop his kid off, so is the guy ahead of him and ahead of him and ahead of him and a few behind him. And in five minutes, your kid's going to be dropped off. You're going to be on your way because it's, it's bad, but it's not awful. Um, in fact, it's just a reality of city living if you're near a school or if you got kids to take to school. So you got to plan the extra time. And you're absolutely right, Mr. Mayor. We're about to send a bunch of kids back to school, some of which have never been there before. It's time to slow down and be careful. All right, thank you. Well, motion here is to uh, receive and file for, uh, to be able to um, get this update. So, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Weffel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 10 is amending City of Dubuque Code of Ordinance, Title 8, Equity and Human Rights, Chapter 5, Fair Housing. Section 8-5-12, Enforcement by Private Persons. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which is to be finally passed be suspended. Second. Motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Mike, please. Or actually, is it Krenna? Sorry, Mike. I think it's me, but that Go, can Mike. be Krenna. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Code Section 8-512 mirrors state law. Because of, of recent state law updates, the city code needs to be amended. City Attorney Crenna Brumwell is recommending City Council adopt this ordinance amendment. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any questions? Simple change to match the law that we now have for the state. Okay, great. So the motion here is to receive and file. Waive the three readings. Trish, can you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. 
Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. Got a motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Absent. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Action item number 11, request for work session for smart parking and mobility management plan. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and set the work session uh, for October 2nd, 2023 at 515 to 630. Second by Farber. Motion by Resnick, second by Farber. All right. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel absent. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Action item number 12 is delivering Dubuque City Services. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file and view the video, and I'll tell you I cheated and watched it already. And wow. <laughs> second by Sprank. And motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I, before we start this one, I just want to say something real quick. You know, I know that um, everybody, this desk has probably watched it, but. Um, you know, when, when we started this series of delivering Dubuque and trying to talk about what it is that cities do, um, one of the things that I started to notice as uh, the last legislative session was occurring was that it wasn't just residents that need to have this message sent to them as well. You know, we, um, it, it starts off by talking about that sometimes we, we hear questions about what it is that any of this money that is spent on your property taxes and your fees actually does. Like, what, what are you actually doing with it? So the idea was to, with this particular video, was to go kind of big and be able to explain that entire picture. So we're hoping that it was able to, to do that. But I think it's important that um, people recognize that there is a lot that happens within a city by a city government on a regular basis, every single day of the week. And that was kind of the story that was being told here. The final thing I'll say is um, Felicia Carner deserves a ton of credit for this particular video. Uh, I know that we see Felicia everywhere from our public information office. She's usually got a camera in hand and she's running after someone, um, hopefully not being knocked over by them while she's taking pictures. But she, um, it, she's an absolutely incredible asset to the city in the way that she puts these things together. So what you're about to watch here is was written and really directed by Felicia Carner. Um, and um, she spent a lot of time, um, probably more time than anybody really wants to spend with me in any day or two days. <laughs> so uh, I, I really appreciated her work on this and big shout out to her as we watch it. So Eric, you can go ahead and roll it. Thank you. What does local government do? When we pay our property taxes and fees that fund the city Dubuque budget, what does that money actually provide for us? I occasionally hear these questions here in Dubuque and even at our state capitol in Des Moines. So for this episode of Delivering Dubuque, I thought we could explore what all the departments of the city of Dubuque are doing to provide us with the services that we need every minute, every hour of every day. To begin, let's start at home. Many city services serve you right in your home. For instance, take a look at your bathroom, a notoriously fought over space. And that might be because of this valuable resource. Water. High quality, safe, treated water is delivered to every Dubuque faucet by our water department. When we turn these knobs, we expect water to flow. And it does. And everything that goes down this drain, or other plumbing, goes back to the city and is received by the Water and Resource Recovery Center. After treatment, this resource is safely returned to our environment. Then, of course, you have your weekly collection set out. What? Mm. Public Works is at your curb every week, rain or shine, to collect the items that no longer have a use for us. Water, sewer, stormwater, and refuse. These fees are facilitated through utility billing, a necessary activity made more equitable through discounts and other assistance programs. City services don't stop at your front door. They're interspersed along your entire route. That historic charm that appears in Dubuque's silhouette? Well, regulations, design reviews, and guidelines established by the city help preserve it. 
The art you see woven throughout the community? The city's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs is committed to supporting projects and organizations that bring vibrancy to our day-to-day -day lives, be it a celebration or a mural at your stop. How are you traveling? By foot, bike, car, or bus? Regardless of the path or how you take it, it's the city's priority to keep you connected and safe. Whether that's a multi-million dollar infrastructure project implemented by our engineering department, or a new bus route offered by Transportation Services. The work is always evolving because the community's needs are always changing. As they do, our geographic information system professionals support city departments through asset management and data mapping that keeps the community connected to services. Staying connected, it goes hand in hand with staying informed. The information you receive by phone, mail, this video, all delivered by our public information office. They're committed to transparently sharing information and awareness around programs, services, news, and amenities, like our parks. Parks and Recreation maintains over 1,200 acres of parkland and over 300 facilities and amenities, including pools, pavilions, athletic courts, miles and miles of trails, ball diamonds, skate parks, and much more. Hundreds of activities and recreational programs are offered every year. And who are they all available to? Yes, you. So while you're out and about during the day, it might not seem like you're interacting with city services, but try seeing it through a different lens. Thanks, bud. It doesn't matter how tasty this treat is, how and where it's prepared, that's important to your safety, which is why it's important to us. The city's health services oversees the inspections of all food establishments in city limits. And restaurants are just a piece of the bigger economic pie. Other slices include our small local shops, hotels, large businesses and employers, and more. Their commitment to Dubuque is met with collaborative efforts by the city's economic development, planning services, and city attorney's offices. It's all part of making Dubuque a more viable and livable community for all. But let's not forget about quality of life. Without that, we may live in a beautiful place, but our residents deserve more. To be more and to better serve, the City of Dubuque strives to meet people and their needs where they are. For example, the Community Impact Division works to address community needs through AmeriCorps programming, volunteer infrastructure, and programming to support individual and family stability. The Multicultural Family Center receives staffing support to enhance their efforts to build unity out of diversity. The Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support they're working to prevent and reduce poverty and increase access to prosperity through policy and systemic changes. Sustainable Dubuque supports community-led projects and efforts to uphold the principles that help us meet the needs of today without compromising our future. And then there's the Carnegie Stout Library. It's our library of things for all people, offering equitable access to millions of assets for our residents. And sometimes more for our community is having access to communities beyond. Our local airport is a critical asset that provides affordable access to air travel for business and leisure. The fact is, the gears of the city are in continuous motion. To carry out day-to-day -day operations and implement policies and priorities set by the city council, they need to be. The city manager's office is responsible for implementation and the overall management of the city. Finance ensures it all stays within budget, while human resources provides personnel support for those carrying out the work. And none of our services would efficiently stay in motion without tools like technology. When it works, it's great. When it doesn't, well, we've all sent a panicked urgent emoji or two to the technology whizzes. For the city, that's the Information Services Department. Thankfully, their team assists with keeping technology working as it should, including keeping us online in case of any emergency. Which brings us to safety and security. We're not gonna make any jokes or witty puns here. Creating a safe environment where everyone can thrive, that's priority number one, and all our departments play a role in that. Public works, engineering, animal control, all of them. At the front of the line is emergency communications. They answer every 911 call, every time, with calm and focused guidance. Next up, and ready to respond at any hour, fire and police. Medical emergencies, vehicle collisions, hazmat incidents, rescues, mental health crises, and tactical responses. You name it. These professionals have dedicated their careers to being prepared. But safety and security are not words reserved just for emergencies. Safe and healthy homes allow residents to live safe, healthy lives. 
To help sustain our community, Housing and Community Development provides housing support and enforces building and health codes, and conducts housing and construction inspections. Make sure I don't see any split. And if those rights to safe housing are infringed upon, Equity and Human Rights is there to help ensure residents are protected under law. We could talk about the services of the city Dubuque for hours, but the camera operator is getting a little tired in the arms, so let's reflect on a few ending thoughts. First, the people behind all our city services are your neighbors, relatives, and friends. They are young and they are nearing retirement. They are lifelong Dubuqueers and they're newcomers. They're you. They are Dubuque. And they see what we all want Dubuque to be. And they are committed to getting us there together. My final plug is for you. The City of Dubuque is a public organization. There are many opportunities for you to give your input on potential projects, the budget, and more. All voices matter. Local government is structured so your voice and ideas for growth are welcomed. So come by a council meeting, drop council members a message, or consider joining a board or commission. That process is coordinated by our city clerk's office. Know that you are the best part of our community. How the City of Dubuque services benefit you is the whole purpose of city government. We all get to build and grow a vibrant, robust, safe, connected, and inclusive place to call our home. And that's how we are delivering Dubuque together. Well, thanks for taking the time to watch that. And, um, put that on an agenda. All right, motion here is to receive and file. Watch that video. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 13 Reimagine Comiskey Park Project Celebration. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Sprank? I have a motion that we receive and file and watch the video. Second. Got a motion by Sprank, second by Jones. This was a fun night, so I can't wait to see this video. You can roll it, please, Eric. of the first and funnest phase of the reimagined Comiskey Park project. Projects like this are successful when they're thoughtfully planned with community input, funded adequately, and then professionally implemented. Thankfully, we had all those ingredients in this $2.4 million project. You all made what this is. This is your part because the decisions we made were based upon all your input and feedback. And I am floored, to be quite honest, at what has happened in such a short period of time. It is beautiful. I really want to thank everybody that helped make this dream a reality. To all the families that helped design it, the children, the neighbors that helped create this new space, and for the vision so everybody in the future can enjoy this new park. This neighborhood is an amazing area, and it's just going to continue to make it better. And we hope you enjoy it and have all kinds of great memories as a family, individually, or with your friends. Today is another great day to be a debuter. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for sticking with us, Marie, to watch that one again. Yeah. <laughs> that is just so much fun. What a fun night and what a fun place. I mean, it has just been packed ever since it opened. And that's in our town. That's in our city. It's just, it's really exciting. Really exciting. All right. Motion there was to receive and file. Watch that video. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next on the agenda are council meeting member reports. All right. Any reports? Mr. Sprank. Thank you. 
Um, for those who say there's nothing to do in this town, they clearly do not read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the much um, this weekend, well, this last week alone, there was National Night Par National Night Out at Comiskey Park, which was two hours of the uh, police department kind of welcoming the families to the neighborhood and the whole community. And then, of course, Saturday there was Saturday and Sunday there was uh, Dubuque Fest, which was a great art in the park in in Washington Park, as well as. Uh, there was Dubuque Main Street did a beer festival, so there is always something going on in our community. So I just you can't, there's got there's always something going on for folks. So. Pretty sure night market is Thursday. Yeah, it just never ends. The summer never ends around here. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Farber, go ahead. So um, as you could tell, my passion for artificial intelligence is increasing on a daily basis, and <laughs> we can thank the National League of Cities ITC subcommittee for that. Um, but I did have the opportunity to um, attend the most recent meeting that we had in Tacoma where we talked not only about artificial intelligence, but we talked about broadband for everyone, and we talked also about universal service. And so those are going to be some of the policies that will come out of the National League of Cities subcommittees that we're working on, and hopefully we will be able to uh, take that down to uh, funding opportunities, grant opportunities for the Dubuque municipality. So. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ruffle. Although we all missed Mayor Kavanaugh while he was taking a little well-deserved break, it was nice as Mayor Pro Tem to be present for the opening of Art on the River, Innovate and Illuminate. And if anyone has not been down yet to see the beautiful sculpture and the outdoor space, please go enjoy it. The hanging baskets, the sound of the river, everything right now is just in full bloom. It's great, so go have yourself some fun on the river. Thank you very much for being there. Hated to miss that one, one of my favorite events all year. Any others? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Um, Sue and I just returned from a riverboat trip from St. Louis to St. Paul, and I'll tell you that the most attractive riverfront along that trip was right here in Dubuque, Iowa, and it's not just because of the sentimentality of it. Um, we were, I, I took the tour to see how it goes, and it was it was pretty cool. As as you know, Travel Dubuque supplies the step on guides for all three uh, riverboat companies for their bus tours, and and they're all the same. They're all the same, but they're all different. Um, each company wants wants different things, and they want a different script than the other company had. So that's been a lot of work for the Travel Dubuque team. Um, but we had a, a local guide get on the bus, and he, he knew his stuff. He knew what was where, and and. Uh, I can't say that I learned a lot because I've been involved with Travel Dubuque since its inception, um, but I can say I was impressed with the home team. So, what a cool opportunity. All right. Thank you for everyone for your reports. We have a closed session, so I'll entertain a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move the City Council going to closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending litigation and, and sale or purchase of real estate. Second, second by Wethel. And a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. For the record, the attorney of the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in closed session is city attorney Krenner Brumwell. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Barber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session. <laughs>